Hi welcome back guys this is your friend. Caller what if with another fiction. What if Deku a gamer of multiverse book now before starting please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this now let's get into the fanfic. Two figures standing side by side march down a marble pathway. Expressions solemn in nature with gazes equally as mournful. Though for two separate reasons. The figure on the left was a short man. Standing just a few heads shorter than the figure to his right. He had starch white ear-length hair, tannish brown skin, and eyes of a pale blue. He, along with the figure next to him, was dressed in a toga, though the figure next to him wore a black one in contrast to his white. On his right wrist was a golden bracelet that had seven different markings etched into them, all of which went in a counterclockwise order going from most prominent to least prominent. Each marking looked something to the effect of this. A morning star shining brightly, a crescent moon gleaming ominously, a timepiece with cracked glass, a skull with a sword sticking out atop its head, a snake surrounding a scepter, an apple with a large bite taken out of it, and finally a hand holding onto a coin with its index and ring fingers. In the man's left hand was a golden staff with a forward-facing halo crafted atop its shaft. It was twice his size which made it seem like it would be cumbersome in his hands. Despite that, he seemed to carry it effortlessly. His face was wrinkled, and he had a magnificent beard that stretched down to his waist, along with a mustache that seamlessly blended into his beard, all of which matched the color of his hair. He appeared frail and old, but beyond that, he was powerful far more powerful than his appearance would let on. Then came the figure next to the man. Like the man next to him, he was male. Unlike the man next to him, he had crimson red skin, with coal black horns poking out from the edges of his forehead, that rose like that of goat's horns curling into themselves and flaring out with pointed tips. His hair, much like his horns, was coal black, but had graying highlights interspersed within. He was tall, foreboding, and teeming with muscle. Physically, he appeared to look like an average strongman, though with less of a gut and more of a refined stomach region, which had been covered by his toga. Peeking out from underneath his garb was a soul peck, which looked as if it was made of stone. His arms were bulky, and if one looked, one could see veins protruding from them. The same having gone with his legs, which rather than ending in feet ended in hooves. He sported no trinkets like the man next to him. He had left them all back at his home, rather than bring them to where they were now. To him, it would have been a waste of time to bring them here, as they were not needed. Not today, anyway. The man's eyes were an electric yellow, with black sclear, and his face was clean-shaven. Compared to the man next to him, he was the exact opposite. The only thing that they shared in equivalency with one another was that they were both as strong as each other though the man in the white toga was slightly stronger than the man dressed in black. Surrounding them was a hallway crafted out of quartz, as was the rest of the building they were in. There were golden markings of stars, galaxies, and other cosmic entities. Portraits of people of varying genders and ages lined the halls, all with names, dates, and rolls on plaques underneath. Pillars erected of quartz kept the fifty-foot-tall roof from crashing down on the two as they continued their trek down the lengthy corridor. The red-skinned man glanced over at the old man, frowning. I cannot believe it is happening again, the red-skinned man grimaced. I thought that you said that we had him sealed permanently last time. Or was that another white lie of yours, much like the other time, father? The old man sighed, his eyes reflecting that of tiredness. We are not having that conversation again, Lucifer. You know as well as I do that, that we can never truly seal him away. Yes, I know, Lucifer interrupted, looking straight ahead, eyes narrowed. I know. His voice carried a hint of disappointment and longing, though it was quickly washed away as he grunted. Then if that is the case then why must we have it continue like this? Especially when it is this close. Would it not be better if we killed it? The old man huffed dismissing Lucifer with a wave of his right hand. Then that defeats the purpose, the old man replied, 
voice low and elderly yet powerful and commanding at the same time. Lucifer's eyes gained a hint of aggravation, though he did not say anything. Instead, he continued forward. As the two finally reached the end of the corridor, they were met with a balcony. And with it, they were able to peer into the distance. While the average mortal soul in the pristine heavens above could not see anything if they stood on the viewing balcony, both the King of Hell and the Almighty could. It was thanks to them being who they were that they could see however far out into the vast reaches of the multiverse as they wished. Over 100 billion light years away, a war was being waged. In the center of the multiverse, seven warriors clashed against a being of pure darkness given human shape with an army of the dead. Spells were fired, incantations recited, as weapons slashed and hacked away at the hordes with very little progress being made. The battle was being fought by a party of seven multiversal warriors hand picked by the Almighty, all of whom were safeguarding the core against the dark entity, an entity that had existed since even before the Almighty, an entity that threatened the very fabric of creation, one that, until as of late, had no way of ever reaching that goal. To some extent, it was the Almighty's fault that this was happening. To some, that would be blasphemous, but it was the truth. Had the Almighty not acted out of haste and rashness on that day, none of this would be happening. It had been one of the only times that he had not foreseen what had happened happening. And as a result, something worse came out of it. The Almighty furrowed his brow, his eyes glowing in blue splendor, whereas Lucifer's glowed a haunting yellow. They were using their enhanced sight to peer out into the battle, worried and tired expressions taking up their visage. It's the same every cycle, like a script being acted out, Lucifer commented. Seven warriors go in to sacrifice their souls to seal a great evil, only for said evil to unleash itself again after a predetermined amount of time, just long enough for us to get another batch of seven to throw back at the beast. It's futile. That is not true, Lucifer, and you know it to be, the Almighty rumbled earning a glare from him. If that were the case, it would be dead already, Lucifer snarled as the Almighty huffed, returning to watching the battle. In the time it had taken to talk, the battle had nearly come to a close. A clash between the leader of the Seven and the Fallen One. Sword clashed against sword, spell deflected spell, until finally a chamber was opened and the final member of the Seven perished, but doing so to open the final lock. The Fallen One cursed them once again and was dragged along with its vast army of darkness into the prison of the Damned before it was launched off into the multiverse. For another 500 billion years, the multiverse was safe. A million lifetimes for the mortals, but a mere blink for the gods. And thus, the cycle continues, the Almighty said, his voice carrying an edge to it. For balance to be restored, we must have these battles. To see who proves victorious, and who controls the right of creation. The core. And each time, we win, adapt, and overcome. That is the lesson that we have learned for eons, and yet you haven't done so. Why is that? Because, Father, unlike you, I noticed it adapting each time. Lucifer retorted, glaring down at the old man, who had turned to face him. Both of their eyes returned to normal, no longer glowing with the infinite power they shared. It takes evil to see how evil works. Have you forgotten that in your infinite span of life, old-timer? Perhaps, but even so I do not see a reason to be upset, the Almighty replied, shrugging his shoulders as he began to walk away. I shall choose another seven, and in doing so we shall prolong its entrapment, until we can find a way to separate the fallen one from his chains and restore the balance. This is what we must do. Lucifer glared at the back of the Almighty's head, stomping toward him with a scowl. It is an exercise in futility. What if there is no way to separate the Fallen One? What then? We are better off killing him than trying to save him. If we could, we would have done so by now, don't you think? That is what you believe, son. But I do not believe that to be the case. Try to live with some hope in that blackened heart of yours, will you? 
the Almighty retorted as Lucifer growled. Just as he was about to speak yet again, a flash of heavenly light appeared before the Almighty, as another figure joined the group. The figure was a woman, with ginger hair and freckles, chocolate-colored skin and similar-colored eyes with a piercing focus were her most prominent features. Dressed in a red and white double-swathed toga, the woman was a head taller than the Almighty and a few heads shorter than Lucifer. She had a pair of folded-up white feathered wings, and above her head was a golden halo in the shape of a star. Sister, Lucifer greeted, as the woman hummed. Brother, I see you came to watch the chaos unfold. How quaint of you, the woman replied, earning a scoff from Lucifer as the Almighty chuckled to himself. I do wish you wouldn't antagonize your brother, Uriel. It is unbecoming of you, the Almighty said as Uriel bowed her head in a silent apology. The Almighty tapped her gently on the head, before gesturing her to raise herself before speaking. Tell me, what have you come to speak to me about? Yes. I would love to get this conversation over and done with. I have a realm to return to, and a daughter to placate, Lucifer said as Uriel blinked in genuine confusion before her gaze turned into a look of anger. You, Lucy, a daughter? Who did you rate for that to happen? Uriel snarled as Lucifer gained an offended gleam in his eyes. You dare assume that I would do that? Lucifer roared. Fury coating his words as hellfire danced at the corners of his mouth. I may be the king of hell, but I am not a monster like the sinners whomst I am torturing, sister. Lucifer growled only to have the back of his head hit by the Almighty's staff. Uriel was not spared of the same treatment and groaned in response. The both of you. Stop acting like infants, the Almighty reprimanded, before setting his gaze on Uriel. And Uriel. That was completely uncalled for. Show your brother some respect. Or need I remind you what we are trying to do? He said as Uriel glared at Lucifer, ignoring her father's gaze entirely. Once a traitor to heaven, always a traitor to heaven. I believe in repentance, father. But Lucifer? He is bathed in sin. He will stab you in the back just like he had before. I know it to be true. He even changed his appearance to match the heathens he commands below. I refuse to believe anyone would willingly bet him, let alone stand near him without threat of being harmed. Uriel spat, as the Almighty's eyes gleamed with power, a radiant blue light echoing off of his person as Lucifer took a step to the right. That is quite enough, Uriel. The Almighty bellowed, making the Archangel of Wisdom and Knowledge take more than a handful of steps back flinching in the process. The power around the Almighty dimmed, his eyes returning to normal as he coughed into his hand. I have met Lucifer's wife, Lilith. She is quite the treat if I must say so myself. I was there for the wedding, after all. An appearance I hadn't expected, but greatly appreciated, Lucifer commented as Uriel balked. Since when? Uriel exclaimed as Lucifer chuckled to himself. He went to speak a witty response, only to stop when the Almighty raised his hand. A silent sign to keep whatever he had wanted to say to himself. Knowing that this argument would continue to go in circles if he didn't keep to himself, Lucifer stayed silent. We are getting sidetracked, Uriel, the Almighty said, lowering his hand. What is it that you have come to tell us? He requested as Uriel cleared her throat. Right. My apologies. Father, we have received bad news. The sealing ritual, while it has not failed, has somehow been tampered with. The Norns, the Sisters of Fate, and a few others who are in direct communication with Lady Fate such as Ezekiel and Azazel, have reported back saying that the prison of the damned will only hold the Fallen One and his armies for 50 billion years rather than the expected 500 billion. Uriel explained as both the Almighty and Lucifer stared with wide eyes. This is a joke, yes? Are you certain? Lucifer questioned as Uriel shook her head. I wish I would, brother. But I speak the truth. Something has happened. We must act now. We need to gather a new group of seven. And we need to do so immediately. I have already called a meeting with the appointed watchers. 
and they will be converging on the Grand Hall in a matter of days to begin the selection process. Uriel responded as the Almighty stroked his beard in thought, his expression one of perplexion. Does something trouble you, Father? Uriel asked as the Almighty mumbled something under his breath, unintelligible by both Lucifer and Uriel. It was only after he stopped stroking his beard that he responded. Yes, a lot is troubling me. Tell the Watchers that I will be there shortly. I must think. Lucifer, return to your daughter and wife. Uriel, go back to your post outside the gates. I have much to think about. The Almighty said as Lucifer bowed like a showman, before a ring of red-hot hell fire surrounded his person, erupting upward in a shower of blazing heat. For a brief moment, Lucifer's true appearance appeared as a shadow amongst the fire, that being of a top hat, and some form of long trench coat. Any other details were missed thanks to the stream of hellfire. After a moment, the hellfire, along with Lucifer, disappeared. Uriel left the same way she appeared, in a beam of holy light, leaving the Almighty to wander the halls of the great chapel. Something had gone wrong. Be it because someone had slipped up during the sealing spell, or be it because the fallen one had grown wise to their tricks. Neither was the better option, both being equally horrible and vexing. Fifty billion years was a massive reduction in time. The new seven would have to be chosen quickly, and in doing so, the quality of character of the seven would not be considered. They would not be the perfect soldiers that the Almighty wanted. That was why the five hundred billion years was needed, so that the Almighty could take his time to pick out of the hundreds of billions of souls who would be sorted and reincarnated into warriors gathered by the seven for the massive war that would take place near the core. It was a long, lengthy process that took a long time to do. He had to weigh their soul before choosing whether or not to reincarnate them under a watcher or to reincarnate them under a spirit or a lesser god. Sure it took a while, but it usually produced wonderful results. But now, he couldn't. He would have to shunt that responsibility off to the Watchers, something he wasn't a fan of doing. Especially with that one. It was something he did not do lightly. But it was something that had to be done regardless of his feelings on the matter. Time was of the essence, and with how little time they had, something needed to be changed for the sake of prosperity. And if his sacrificing control over the seven was what needed to be done, then so be it. After all, who was he to challenge the greater will? The greater will. A formless entity that had given him the power of creation to be the Almighty. The entity that created the core that they protected with all of their power. The very reason why the seven were created in the first place, along with the rest of the soldiers. While the Almighty was a god out there, Beyond time and space, the greater will, along with its counterpart the lesser mind, had been the very things that had created the multiverse. The secret puppet masters behind everything that only the Almighty was aware of due to them being his creator. It was not the Almighty's place to question their rules. He was but an avatar for them, and he would fulfill what was asked of him. He and the Watchers had planning that needed to be done. So as the greater will and lesser mind command of him. Darkness, for as far as the eye could see, it was haunting just how much nothing felt like blistering frigidness. Was this what the afterlife was supposed to be? Nothing but a big empty dark room made of quartz and granite tile. If that was true, then that meant religion had lied to them. The them in question being a light blue featureless humanoid figure standing smack in the center of the strange room they had found themselves in. It was small about the same size as a standard gazebo, just far taller than a regular gazebo, but width-wise it was about the same. Enclosed and claustrophobic would be the best words to describe the place that the figure had found themselves in. Pristine white walls with strange carvings that they did not recognize surrounded them like a cage, with marble granite tiles underneath them. Their astral feet touched the ground, and they noticed that it felt a bit wet. As if it had rained in here recently, somehow. In front of them was a pair of tall, fifteen-foot doors. They were made out of dark brown wood, with intricate swirls and patterns carved into them, 
almost attempting to look like flowing winds over top vast, barren valleys. The figure barely had been able to reach out to touch the door, when they hesitated, not out of concern or fear, but out of confusion. Who were they? Where were they? How had they got here in the first place? There were scarce few things that the figure could remember. All they remembered was the searing hot pain of a blade being lodged into their throat. A kitchen knife, if they had remembered correctly. They remembered the fear that had caked over them at that moment, the desperation, and more importantly, the betrayal. One moment, they had been gasping for breath, reaching out toward their attacker as a means of attempting some form of self-defense. They remembered that, for a split second, their attacker almost looked remorseful, but that had been all that they had been able to gather before dying. After that, they found themselves here, standing inches away from the door to this strange-looking temple. A question burned through their mind. Assuming this place was the afterlife, then where exactly were they? Were they in heaven, or were they in hell? At this point, there was no reason to deny it. They knew they had died, otherwise, they wouldn't be here. They accepted the fact that they had died. That wasn't the problem here. The problem was everything else surrounding their death. The who, the what, the where, and the why. None of those questions would ever have answers, because those memories were no longer there. Almost as if someone had reached into their mind and pulled them out, leaving nothing but blank spaces. The only question they had for that was why. Why remove their memories, but keep the most traumatic one, that being of their death? Was it some kind of sick form of torture? To know that they had died in one of the most brutal ways imaginable suffocating on their blood, slowly choking on the very thing that was meant to keep them alive, all the while staring eye to eye and face to face with the person responsible. To know that they had been powerless in that moment, a gust of frozen air swept over the figure knocking them out of their thoughts. As fast as the gust of wind came, it left, and in its place, they felt something no, someone behind them, someone powerful. Instinctively, be it out of fear or curiosity, they did not know. They turned around, craning their neck upward to see who had appeared, and what they saw left them awestruck. Standing before them, eyes of a translucent blue staring down at their blank slate of a face, the source of the powerful presence stood with crossed arms and a nonplussed expression. They were tall, easily over seven feet with long black hair that reached down past the center of their back in bangs that swept to the left. They had a peach color to their skin, and they held themselves to a high standard. They were thin, but not sickly so. Just thin enough so that they would be underestimated. They were dressed in a black elegant long-sleeve open-faced blazer, adorned with a red flower pin on their left breast pocket. The blazer had a golden trim, as did the pants that they were wearing, complemented by a long purple flowing cape adorned in golden rose motifs. Just peeking out from underneath, the unbuttoned blazer was a bright red shirt that stopped just at the midriff, teasing what appeared to be a well-built body. My, my. You've met quite the brutal end, spirit. The masculine voice of the entity rumbled throughout the room, echoing in the back of the spirit's mind as they flinched. For a brief second, they felt the searing pain in their throat again, falling to their knees and howling in pain as the entity chuckled. You have the sweetest of screams, spirit. The agony, the pain, it is something everyone goes through. I'm glad to see that you've remembered it, if only partially. The entity snapped his fingers, the pain disappearing instantly as the spirit slumped forward, breathing heavily as their hands touched the wet ground. They looked up at the entity, and if they had a face, they would have been scowling. I can sense the anger coming off you, little spirit. There's no need to be so upset. It was just a little sensory illusion. I could have done far worse. Screw you, the spirit spat in between breaths as the entity snorted, shaking his head in what the spirit thought might have been disbelief before chuckling quietly to himself. That's no way to greet someone as great as I. But I suppose first impressions mean everything. If nothing else, it was only a harmless prank, the entity said before doing a bow similar to how a showman would. 
I am Loki Lofajarsson, the god of mischief of the Nordic people. And I was born to a great purpose, Loki introduced, before standing up to his full height and shrugging his shoulders. Though what that great purpose is supposed to be, I haven't the foggiest. Shoulders slumped, as the spirit sat in awe. They had just told a god to screw himself. That most likely no, definitely didn't put them in his good books. Loki stared, tilting his head to the side ever so slightly enough to where it looked mocking. No more witty quips, I see. Well, that wasn't the intention, but I suppose it works. You see, Loki began, squatting to their level with a mysterious gleam in his eyes. I brought you here because you, my dearest spirit, are going to be something special. More special than even I eventually, Loki continued, before taking a step back, outstretching his right hand and pointing the palm of it in their direction. But that special thing I mentioned will be kept from you for now. Because that wouldn't be nearly as fun. Just before the spirit had a chance to ask any questions, a ball of green energy manifested itself in front of Loki's palm. The spirit took a step back, fearing that this might have been some kind of attack, and raised their arms to protect their face. The ball of green energy zipped through the air as fast as a lightning bolt and hit the spirit in the center of their torso. Instead of being flung back like they had expected, they were still standing. Lowering their arms, confusion washed over them, and before they could question anything yet again, a screen manifested in front of them. The screen was holographic and appeared to be a faded green color and more to the point. It displayed a question with a multiple-choice answer. What is the biological sex of your choosing? Note. Previous identities from your past life do not matter when factoring this question, as this is your new life, and therefore you may choose what you want to be to reflect your state of mind, personality, and comfortability. The question was innocent enough. The answers weren't strange either. Male, female, or non-binary were their options. They looked back to Loki, before looking back toward the holographic screen, confusion decorating their expressionless face as their forehead scrunched in a manner that dictated as such. What is this? What does it look like? It's a character creation screen you humans have in those video games of yours, Loki replied, a small smirk taking up his visage. Oh, and when you create your avatar, please don't make it the same appearance as that of your previous life. That wouldn't be any fun. The spirit snorted at that, narrowing their non-existent eyes. Not that I remember what I used to look like. Now then, let's give this a shot. As soon as the spirit thought that, they began to create their appearance after selecting the female option that had been presented to them. Throughout what felt like hours, the spirit constructed the body that they wished to have. And by the time they were done, Loki had to admit it wasn't what they had expected them to be. Loki had known a thing or two about the spirit that this new soul had been. He had expected something else entirely other than what he saw. But he supposed that it did make this even more interesting than what he had initially assumed. Standing before him was a young lady, seemingly around 16 years old, which had been the age at which they had perished. Black and pink hair sat divided evenly down to her cheeks, with her bangs swept to the left. Emerald green eyes shone in the dark like that of the actual gems, along with a small barely noticeable frown taking up their visage. Their cheeks were dusted with a pink hue due to the cold in the chamber, though that would be gone once they had left the chamber and entered a warmer environment. Then came her body which honestly was nothing special he had seen far better before, and would most likely continue to in his eternal life. But, for human beauty standards, considering how sexualized they were, and how gross it was, she was probably one of those who resided at the top, and would be considered to have won the genetic lottery, so to speak. The teen's body was slender, yet not so thin that she looked emaciated. Rather, it was more the typical high schooler appearance. Just enough weight to where they looked average, but not so much that anyone would consider her unappealing again. Something he didn't understand about humans, and why weight mattered, but he digressed. Her breasts were nothing special, 
and nothing he hadn't seen before on a woman. He honestly didn't understand why humans got their rocks off to sacks of fat attached to another human's chest. But then again who was he to judge? If he were to describe them in measurement sizes, because humans were so fickle with measurements for some stupid reason, that yet again he couldn't understand for the life of him, he'd guess somewhere around the range of 84.5 to 88.5 centimeters. He wasn't about to touch a miner's chest just to measure them. A god he may be, but he had morals of his own. Besides, his eyes could see and interpret all, so it really wasn't much of a guess more than it was a fact. Her torso was shaped like that of an hourglass, and not those overly sexualized versions of what one would consider an hourglass figure. But a true hourglass figure, one with a little more meat on her bones toward the lower and upper waist and thighs. The legs gradually thinned out past the knees, leaving just her feet. She also had a lack of hair anywhere on her body, meaning it was probably a personal preference. Of note, there was one thing that Loki did find a little strange, and that was the scar on her neck. Perhaps she placed it there as a means to remind herself of her death. That was fair. He did strip her of her memories. So with her having that last and fatal memory as a reminder of who she used to be, it made sense for her to want to hang on to it. Even if that memory was a traumatic one, though who didn't like a little bit of trauma in their backstory. For height, she was about 5 feet 5 inches tall the average height a human woman could have. Why she had decided to not go for anything taller than that was beyond him. But then again, Loki wasn't allowed to intervene, even if she was being incredibly bland right about now. And with that, it was done. The teenager before him had created her appearance, and by all means, aside from the hair and the scar, it looked a little boring. Among all of the warriors who had served under his banner in eras past, she was probably the least sexualized. But, considering her young age, he viewed that as a good thing. It meant that she had some sense of reason, rather than going for the whole sex appeal route that most under his banner did. He didn't know what it was with him and attracting those types of people. But then again he never was the one who selected them up until this cycle. So maybe that said something about the Almighty and not him. I must admit, I was expecting something a little more. I don't know. Fantastical. After all, given the opportunity to look whatever way you want, I would have expected something with a little more oomph. Still, I must say, even if you are a little young for my tastes, I would be envious of someone who managed to date you, Loki said as the teen narrowed her eyes. What is that supposed to mean? The teen grumbled, earning a half-hearted chuckle from Loki without answering her question. He looked down at her, arms no longer crossed as he snapped his fingers. Another set of screens appeared before her, seven to be exact. Each screen detailed the names of what she recognized to be classes from video games that she had used to play when she was younger. When she was alive. Don't think about that. Not that there isn't anything to think about. Although, why would Loki be showing me this? Then again he did mention something about the video games humanity played. So maybe this is more in line with that? She noted, frowning. The classes available to her were Barbarian, Warrior. Martial artist, wizard, sorcerer, priest, and cultist. The last one was strange, considering she had never seen it before. Even then, priest was a rare sight. Usually, that kind of role was saved for non playable characters in the world of the game, and either acted as healing stations or saving stations. So, for it to be added as a playable class for whatever this supposed game was supposed to be, because it was obvious now that this was indeed a game bent the typical rules of a traditional game. It would also explain the cultist. For every religion, there was a cult, and so a cultist class was probably the direct opposite of those who chose the priest class. And while she certainly had questions, she knew that Loki wasn't going to answer them. So instead of even bothering to try, she decided to read what was in front of her. Each class had their own description, and all of them were extremely detailed. She had expected as much because clearly she was being asked to choose. 
The last thing she wanted to do was make an uninformed decision. And so, starting from the left and working all the way to the right, her options were as follows. Barbarian. Your typical physical attacker with weaponry. As a barbarian you can use abilities to make yourself stronger and hit harder, giving your attack stat an exceptional boost, along with physical strength. ATK starts at 15 rather than 5, and physical strength starts at 20 rather than 15. Swords are best used with a barbarian, as well as small shields. Unfortunately, your magic stats start at 0 rather than 5, and your arcane wisdom starts at 0 rather than 15 so using any kind of spell will be beyond you for a long time. Warrior Warriors are your middle-of-the-road types, with even stats across the board. As a result, there are no increases to certain stats or decreases. If you want to be bland, pick this. It is the safest option, but it is not a fun option. Most weapons are available to you from the get-go, though certain magically inclined weapons are barred from your use. The same as certain attacking weapons due to your status as a warrior, meaning brutish weapons are above you. Martial Artist Warriors who do not fight with weapons. Martial artists train all of their lives to perfect their craft, that being hand-to-hand -hand combat. Martial artists sacrifice ranged attacks with weapons for a strictly hand-to-hand -hand style of combat and or restricting themselves to short-ranged weaponry while mixing in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Martial artists are also allowed to use magic, though to a limited degree. Critical chance, rather than starting at zero, starts at 25%. Wizard. The essential class if you wish to specialize in elemental magic. As a wizard you have access to elemental spells, but as a result, you are more squishy, and HP is reduced from 100 to 50. To make up for that, your magic stats are far better than normal going from 5 to both M, ATK and M, deaf to 20 off the bat. The same goes for Arcane Wisdom going from 15 to 45. Your physical strength will start at 5 rather than 15 should you pick this option. Holy and Demonic Magic cannot be used if you are going with this class unless your subclass says otherwise. Furthermore, you are limited to Earth, Wind, Water, and Fire Magics unless your subclass says otherwise. Sorcerer. Similar to wizards, they are an essential class if you wish to specialize in magic. The difference between a wizard and a sorcerer is that a sorcerer has access to more than just elemental spells. Not only that, but they do not have to sacrifice HP to specialize in them. Although their physical attributes are reduced, ATK, defense, and physical strength being have two, two, and 7 they make up for it by having the same bonus as Wizard, having all magic stats doubled, M, ATK, M, Def, and Arcane Wisdom 10, 10, 30, and not only that, but Demonic and Holy Magics are available off the get-go without needing to sacrifice faith or blasphemy, with the only major downside to it being that you can only pick one before the other is locked away forever. Priest The standard class for Holy Magics as well as holy weaponry. As a priest, you have access to a cavalcade of holy magics at your disposal right off the bat, most of which aren't offensive in nature more than they are supportive. Your faith stat is doubled as a priest, starting at 30 rather than 15, as well as your magic defense stat, which now starts at 10 rather than 5. However, your critical chance stat will start in the negatives, starting at minus 50%, and Blasphemy not only starts at zero, but cannot be upgraded. Demonic magics are barred from use, and will actively damage you if you attempt to use them. The same goes with Demonic Weaponry. Cultist. The standard class for demonic magics, as well as demonic weaponry. As a cultist, you have access to a cavalcade of demonic magics at your disposal right off the bat, most of which aren't offensive in nature more than they are debilitating to your enemy. Your blasphemy stat is doubled as a cultist, starting at 30 rather than 15, as well as your defense stat, which now starts at 10 rather than 5. However, your stamina is halved, going from 150 to 75, and faith not only starts at 0, but cannot be upgraded. 
holy magics are barred from use and will actively damage you if you attempt to use them. The same goes with holy weaponry. Each option made reference to things that she had a feeling were supposed to reference her supposed stats, which again made sense given the context. Just from a surface glance, it was clear that you were supposed to think in depth about your choice. But she had already decided when she saw that it was an option. Pick your class. You'll be needing one for the foreseeable future. Oh, and this is permanent. You cannot change it once you've picked it, Loki said emphasizing the word permanent, which echoed in the small chamber they had found themselves in. However, for her, the choice had already been made when she saw the option, immediately picking sorcerer as the class screens went away in the blink of an eye. Huh. Well, usually it takes a while for someone to pick their class. You sure were confident in your choice. To that, the teen shrugged her shoulders with a nonplussed look on her face. I know my stuff, and I always do a sorcerer build in any RPG game I've played. Tabletop or otherwise, she replied as she blinked, before realizing something. Oh, yeah. Uh, I know you didn't ask, but... Your name is Jolin Brooks. Yes, of course, I know. It's insulting for you to think that I don't know. I am a god, after all, mortal, Loki said as Jolin flinched, her face going red with embarrassment. Loki smirked, before snapping his fingers again as another set of screens took up Jolin's line of sight. A list of more classes appeared, although they all had some sort of relation to the sorcerer class mixed with another in them. The choices were interesting, to say the least. They offered a wide variety of things, each with its own benefits and downsides. Well, mostly the first one. The others do not have much in terms of downsides or benefits. Those choices being Druid, Barbary, and Sorcerer. Druids are nature's first line of defense, and as such they must be monstrously strong and in tune with nature. Their physical strength and arcane knowledge are doubled 15 to 30, as are their ATK and M, ATK 5 to 10. On the flip side, their blasphemy and faith stats start at 0, and their mana starts halved 50 to 25 although they gain access to a nature-based spell and nature-based perk right off the bat. Necromancers Sorcerer Cultist Necromancers are some of the most morally bankrupt magic casters in the multiverse, using the dead as their pawns and in doing so defiling the dead, which was properly laid to rest for their own, mostly nefarious, purposes. They show no regard for life, but have a strange passion for death and its effects. They start with a basic necromantic spell, for the cost of having 25% less HP and endurance 75 GP and 38 endurance. Warlock Wizard Sorcerer Warlocks have access to dark magics, as well as regular magics and elemental magics, and are extremely talented with them. Morality is out of the question when magic is involved, and they will do whatever is needed to test out a new spell or research magic. Of note, the only magic they are unwilling to use is blood magic. Dread Knight Warrior Sorcerer, cruel, evil, and disturbed individuals who have made an oath to Lucifer. And as such they are essentially his debt collectors across the multiverse, retrieving souls from those who made deals with him. Those who have made an oath to Lucifer know the path that they will take is a long and blasphemous one. But take it regardless, as to them. God has done nothing for them. The first three classes, Druid, Necromancer, and Warlocks, she was all familiar with. She had even used them before in games like Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, and she had even done a magic build in Dark Souls, even if it might have been a bad idea. But a Dread Knight, just by the description of it, she was put off by it. Cruel, evil, disturbed individuals, made an oath to Lucifer, if that wasn't evil in all caps, then she didn't know what was. And yet, despite that, there was an air of intrigue about it. It was new, it was strange, and more importantly, it was something that called out to her. She often did the evil route in games first, mostly because they were the funniest to her. Say what you will about how that painted her as a person, but it was the truth. That, and reading further into the description given about the Dread Knights, 
The idea of essentially being a debt collector sounded both boring, yet also interesting. Especially when it mentioned the multiverse, an idea she had been familiar with even as a concept. More to the point, if anyone was stupid enough to make a deal with the devil, it must have meant that they were bad people. So essentially, in a twisted sense, she was protecting the multiverse. And that, that was both daunting and fun daunting, because it was the multiverse, and fun because that meant she would be able to travel through it. Still though, that right there, the idea of the multiverse was a spectacle in and of itself. It was a common theory among astrologers and pseudo-conspiracy theorists, and to find out it was real not only blew her mind, but opened up things far more than they ever had been before. The idea behind there being more than one version of the known universe was insane, and this just confirmed it. It was both relaxing knowing that there were possibly multiple versions of herself out there, and also slightly disturbing. All of that aside, she lingered on her choices. She could go with something safe, like a warlock, or even a necromancer she didn't want to be a druid since that never really appealed to her. Or, she could pick the thing she had no familiarity with and no knowledge of, aside from that it was supposedly the evil option. It was a hard choice, really, it was. At least she knew what a necromancer was, and she was very familiar with warlocks. But the idea of being something she had never so much as even heard whispers of, she had to admit, it was tempting. Uh, what's a dread knight? As Jolin asked that question. A devilish smirk took up Loki's visage. That immediately made her weary of asking the question, which was further compounded by the answer Loki provided her with. Well, why don't you find out? I'm sure you'll be pleasantly surprised, Loki said as Jolin felt a lump in her throat. Her gut instinct was to go with something safe, like being a necromancer or a warlock because again, she had no interest in being a druid but she guessed that it was her curiosity speaking for her. Because ultimately despite everything telling her not to pick the mysterious option, she tapped on Dreadknight. The moment she picked that option, the screens disappeared, only to be replaced by three more, each of them being even more confusing, and also intriguing, than the last. Unholy Punisher These Dreadknights find themselves in a unique position amongst their ilk using holy magic to perform their wickedness upon those who had tried to swindle the king of hell. By twisting and corrupting something pure and innocent into something devilish and violent, they unleash holy magic against those who would dare do something so obscene and find ways to turn what was meant to heal into a weapon of death and suffering. Unholy punishers also find themselves having more faith than others in their group of twisted warriors to make sure that their holy magic is at its strongest. As an unholy punisher, whenever you pray, your faith stat doesn't go up by one or two points depending on where you're praying, but rather goes up by two to four points. You also get to pick between God's hand for holy magic or the Book of Hell's wisdom for Dread Knight magic at the start, and unlock the latter at spell level 500. Knight of the Crucible Another facet of Dread Knights that call upon the ancient dragons for their powers to bring forth misery onto those who would attempt to try and get out of their bargain with their master, just as they were intended to. These unique kinds of Dread Knights find themselves breathing fire or transforming parts of their bodies into draconic features to increase their damage while balancing it with regular forms of magic so as to not befall the dragon's curse and turn into a dragon themselves. The form of draconic magic they wield is that of the lands between, where most magic has a negative downside to it, hence the possibility of losing oneself to becoming a dragon, dying a death of personality, and turning into a hideous beast. As a knight of the crucible, you get to pick between vow to Placidusax for ancient dragon magic, or the book of hell's wisdom for dread knight magic at the start, and unlock the latter at spell level 500. Voidbringer. Voidbringers lurk in the shadows and are the assassins of the Dread Knight moniker. Voidbringers do not like overstaying their welcome, nor do they like prolonged fights. As far as they are concerned, the best way to get the job done is to do so quickly and effectively, with or without assistance. 
Voidbringers use special void magic to assist in making their kills quicker and more efficient. All for the low cost of lowered physical strength 15 to 7 and faith 15 to 5 in the beginning. On top of this, as a Voidbringer, you also get to pick between Shadowman's Binding Promise for Void Magic or the Book of Hell's Wisdom for Dread Knight Magic at the start and unlock the latter at spell level 500. Seeing as she was locked into being a Dread Knight now, she had no choice but to pick between the options before her further proven by there not being a back button for her to try and redo her choice. In hindsight, she felt a little dumb. But then again, what was there to be said? Not much, really. She made her choice, so she needed to lay with it. Upon looking over her three options for what she had to assume were different variants of being a Dread Knight, one stood out to her the most. That being Voidbringer. Sure, it lowered physical strength from 15 to 7 and faith from 15 to 5, whatever that meant. But it gave her access to a type of magic she had only seen in some modded versions of Diablo and Elder Scrolls. Void magic. She never had the best computer when she was still alive, so she always had to play the console version of the games that came out. But from what she watched on YouTube, void magic was often shown off to be the most powerful mostly because it was never intended to be in the games. But she digressed. That, and the other two options just seemed boring. Was that the word? No, that wasn't it. While Unholy Punisher sounded cool, Holy magic was something she had no inherent interest in. If she did, she probably would have picked Warlock and chose that as her option of religious magics between Holy and Daimonic. Then there was the Knight of the Crucible, which sounded powerful, up until the idea of having no choice but to hold yourself back so as to not lose oneself into becoming a dragon came up. That was not appealing at all. If she was going to be a magic user, she was going to use magic and do so with carefree abandonment. Otherwise, what was the point? Besides, she always wanted to play around with void magic. And now, she was being given the option to do so. And so, after giving the other options a pass for both valid and personal reasons, she tapped on Voidbringer. It was then that she was given another pair of screens, a decision. This one having to do with the aforementioned magic tomes that belong to the Voidbringer class. Which tome of magic do you wish to start with? Book of Hell's Wisdom. A tome filled to the brim with magic tailored made for Dread Knights. Burn your enemies to a crisp with uncurable flames. Decay the land with your very fingertips. Fashion armies out of suits of armor emboldened to serve the cause by imbuing them with hellfire, and much more. Should you pick the Book of Hell's Wisdom, you will not be disappointed. Shadowman's Binding Promise A tome filled to the brim with the magic of the void. Do you wish to bend the very darkness with your will alone? Do you wish to become one with the very shadows you walk across? Do you wish to manipulate the ethereal void of darkness and space itself? Then you should take this tome of magic and use it. You will not be displeased with the power it gives you. Warning. By picking a tome, you will be forsaking the other until you get to spell level 500, which is done by using spells multiple times, unlike when she was picking the variant of Dread Knight she wanted to be. This time she did not even so much as give the other option a passing glance. She tapped on Shadowman's binding promise without even considering the Book of Hell's wisdom. After all, she would get it eventually. And besides, she had specifically picked this class to use void magic, and gods damn it if she wasn't going to stick to it. While the Book of Hell's Wisdom did sound interesting, it wasn't as if she wasn't going to be able to get to spell level 500 to figure it out anyway. Right? I see. Well then, if you are happy with your choice, Mrs. Brooks, take a good look at what you have so far. As Loki said that, he once again snapped his fingers as the other screens disappeared, replacing them with what appeared to be a character sheet screen, which had been labeled as such. Character sheet. Name. Jolin Brooks. Level. 1. Title. None. Sex. Female. Age. 16. Sexuality. Bisexual. 
with an opposite sex lean inferred from viewing the user's past life. Race. Human possibility of change over time. Height. 5, 4, 162 centimeters. Weight. 111 pounds, 49 kilograms. Hair color. Black and pink, left side black, right side pink. Hairstyle. Chin length with a fringe swept to the left. Skin color. Peach white. Eye color. Emerald green with slit irises. Bust size. 34 dd 86.5 centimeters. Class. Sorcerer. Subclass. Dread Knight Voidbringer. Magic Tomes. Shadaman's Blessing Void Magic. Health Points. 100 F+. Plus. Mana. 50 F. Stamina. 150 E. Endurance. 50 F. Attack. 2 F. Defense. 2 F. Magic Attack. 5 F. Magic Defense. 5 F. Physical Strength. 7 F. Arcane Wisdom. 30 F. Faith. 5 F. Blasphemy. 15 F. Critical Chance. 0. Critical Damage. 50%. Spell Slots. 1 Empty. Perk Slots. 1 Empty. Trait Slots. 1 Empty. Jolin ignored the top half of her character sheet and saw her stats. And upon seeing them, she felt insulted. But then again, she should have expected the small numbers attributed to her power. Considering she was just starting, it made sense for her to be weak. To start off strong would defeat the whole point of this being structured like a video game. Although, if there was one thing that didn't make sense to her, it would have to be the grades next to the numbers. Out of all of the games she had played, Never had she seen a game that had grades next to the stat numbers. If there was one, it either hadn't come out when she had died, that is in the year 2011, or she never played it or watched anything regarding it. Still, it's a little disappointing, Jolin pouted as the screens disappeared. When they did, two more screens took their place, both being labeled Perk and Trait. Perk. Demonic Pact. You have made a pact with Lucifer. As such, you take 75% less damage from fire-based magic, weapons, or abilities, and you are immune to all forms of burning. However, you will take 50% more damage from holy magic, weapons, and abilities. All holy-aligned individuals are aware of your pact upon seeing you, and those who are holy-aligned view you with distrust upon first meeting. Trait. Blood drinker. You drink blood. Huzzah! Drinking blood allows you to heal up to 50% of your HP, which can be important. As a result of this trait, your teeth are extra sharp, allowing you to pierce the skin of anyone regardless of their stats, so long as it is through biting. Upon biting someone, it will leave them with a blood loss status effect. It will sap away a small amount of their HP 5%, and stun them for upwards of 5 seconds. If an enemy does not have blood, then it will be pointless. Be warned, drinking too much blood will slowly start to turn you into a vampire. If you drink more than five pints of blood in a week, you will no longer be considered human, and your race will change into that of a fully-fledged vampire. Your stats will change given the race swap, and this trait will be replaced with true vampire. Furthermore, you cannot ignore your hunger for blood as a meter will appear underneath your stamina meter, indicating how much time you have left until you must consume more blood. If she were to be completely honest with herself, both the perk and the trait that she just got were pretty overpowered, one more so than the other. Namely, Demonic Pack. It made her essentially immune to fire-based attacks and prevented her from being hurt when she was put on fire. Though, she assumed it would still and that she simply didn't take damage from being on fire. Not that she wanted to find out, mind you. Then came the trait, which was, in her opinion, the lesser of the two. Blood drinker, at least to her, seemed to be a little stupid. If she wasn't a vampire, then why did she need to drink blood every now and again? That was a vampire thing to do, not a human thing to do. 
Not to mention what did it have to do with her supposed pact with Lucifer. Was it thrown in there as a thanks for picking the Dreadknight subclass? If that was the case, that was even stupider. Not to mention, it was practically useless. Sure, it did damage via percentage, which most of the time, depending on the game it was in, was extremely powerful. But here it really wasn't, as the damage it dealt was only a measly 5%. She guessed that the stun would be helpful, and whatever blood loss was supposed to do would be too. And if that had been all, then maybe it would only be just okay. But then came the final part. The caveat, in her humble opinion, was completely and utterly stupid. The whole, if you drink too much blood you become a vampire bit was actually annoying, and all it did was add an unnecessary risk factor to the whole thing. Essentially, she had to toe the line between her humanity and becoming a godforsaken beast of the night. Of course, nothing can be too simple, can it? I knew there was going to be some kind of curvy ball. There's no way I get all of this power without there being some kind of stupid, haha, got you, bit. I should have known better, especially with things tied to the literal devil. The screens disappeared, and in the upper left-hand corner of her vision, she saw what appeared to be four meters, all stacked atop one another, each colored differently. There was a red meter, which was labeled hit points, a blue meter which was labeled mana, a green meter which was labeled stamina. Last but not least, there was a white meter which was labeled thirst, which was currently full, something that had only been there thanks to her stupid trait. And that should be everything. Uh, wait, hold on. Before she could ask what it was that Loki was referring to, he snapped his fingers, and as soon as he did, she suddenly felt warmer. Upon looking down at herself, and seeing a black hoodie and a pair of grey sweats. It was only then that she realized she had been naked the entire time, and as a result, had been accidentally flashing a god. Her whole face went red with embarrassment, with her barely being able to keep a straight face as Loki laughed to himself. Shut up, it's not funny, Jolin barked, though that didn't seem to stop Loki from laughing. As a matter of fact, her reaction seemingly only got him to laugh harder. It got to the point where he had to wipe a tear from his left eye, which only made Jolin more embarrassed and equally upset not that there was anything she could realistically do about it. After a moment, he calmed himself, sighing as he did so. Oh, no, it was very funny. Though I guess in part, it was my fault for not putting something on you. I picked your outfit from a previous memory of yours, and seeing as you wore it quite frequently, I figured it would bring you some form of comfort, Loki noted, as Jolin looked down at her new set of clothes. They were, in fact, familiar to her. She couldn't remember why, only that they were familiar to her because of what Loki had said. Though, considering he's the god of mischief, it could just be a prank of his. Not that I don't believe him, but still, Jolin mused. Loki was the god of mischief. His whole thing was causing chaos and doing mischievous things. Like the time he had fucked a horse. That was something that she distinctly remembered about him. It was weird, but then again he was a god. So to her what was weird could have been expected of him. Well, now that everything is done and dusted, it's time for your new life to begin Tilda, Loki said. His tone carrying a hint of what she could only describe as excitement and also some form of perverse gratification. My last toy broke recently, so getting a new one so quickly after the last keeps things from getting boring. What? Now, the world you'll be taken to is one that you've probably never heard of nor seen before. But that's usually half the fun of these things. Seeing as you're what we like to call a system user, you lot usually have a goal when you travel to a new world. And yours is to save this world from itself. I'm sure it won't be so bad, right? Loki said all the while a mysterious green smoke began to curl around Jolin's feet. Jolin panicked. Was he not listening to her? What the hell did he mean his last toy broke recently, as a matter of fact, now that she thought about it? And the more she thought about what her situation was, the more this seemed to be like those Ice Sky Light novels that she read. 
like Sword Art Online, though with a far less dystopian premise. And if this was anywhere near close to that, then the panic she was feeling was more than justified. The last thing she wanted to do was die again. Dying sucked. She had no guarantee of survival, and that terrified her. H. Hey, what do you? Oh, and while you're there, be sure to spread some chaos, okay? As soon as Loki said that, he snapped his fingers, and Jolin Brooks began to turn to white dust. The last thing that Loki saw on her face was sheer panic and terror. Not that he cared all too much. The large wooden doors opened, the creaking noise reverberating through the chamber of second chances, as the dust she was turned into was sent flying out the door at blindingly fast speeds alongside the green smoke that would actually take her to the world that she was being sent to. A small, mischievous smile took up his visage. There was a reason why he had specifically chosen that soul. She had the most potential out of the bunch that had been selected for the Watchers to use. He was lucky he had been the one to notice her first, because otherwise things probably wouldn't have been nearly as fun. Given what he knew about her, her mannerisms, and the way she conducted herself in her last life, Jolin Brooks as she went by now, would be, without a shadow of a doubt, the strongest of the new generation of multiversal system users. That much he knew. Of course, that was assuming she played her cards right and didn't get herself killed in her first world. That would have been a complete disappointment. The world he was sending her to had already been affected by three other normal, non-multiversal system users, Akka the Riffraff, so it already had a magical tint to it. And while he could have sent her to a generic fantasy world like the New World, Central Axis World, Britannica, Remnant, or Hell, if he was really cruel, the lands between. But, seeing as he wasn't a sadist like Zeus was or a gluttony for strength like Shiva, he didn't care for throwing his ward at a brick wall and watching her squirm. No. Loki had a goal in mind. And it all had to do with what he knew to be there. After all, that thing was there. And the last thing that he wanted was for it to sink its non-existent fangs into another world and corrupt it. It already started the process in the aforementioned lands between, as well as a few other places that were now barred from sending system users to due to corruption. So, if she could weed it out, then it would make things better. Loki might have liked chaos, but what that thing represented was more than just chaos. It represented death, destruction, and an all-around bad time for anything not already corrupted by it. If that thing got its way, then the Fallen One would get another world of souls to add to its army. And that would be a very, very bad thing. Well, if she's able to weed it out or not, I don't really care. All I care about is the entertainment of the whole thing. That is more important to me than anything else at the moment, Loki thought as he stepped out of the Chamber of Second Chances. He was the last of the Watchers to resurrect their wards, and according to Multiversal Time, even though it had only been about four hours for Jolin to make her character, in reality, it had already been four hundred years, give or take, where one was in the universe. Jolin was being sent to one of the closest parts in the multiverse, and a freshly made version of that universe, having only been existing for the last thirty years, that is thirty minutes ago for him. As far as the mortals there were concerned, though, it had been thousands, and only recently, that is twenty years ago, System users started to make their mark there, changing it irreversibly in certain aspects, while it remained normal in others. Welp, I should probably get to my viewing quarters. The last thing I want is to miss something important, Loki thought, as a beam of golden white light surrounded him. One moment, he was a few feet outside of the chamber of second chances, the next, he was standing in front of his television and behind the seat of his couch and promptly took a seat. The TV was styled after a 40-inch flat-screen TV, mounted on a starry night sky-esque wall. The chair he was sitting in was a leather-bound recliner with a built-in drink holder, which had an infinitely refilling wine glass that changed wines every time it was emptied. His chair was out in the open and in a random corner of heaven, separated from everything else. His punishment for accidentally destroying a monument of the first human. 
Not that he cared all too much. It wasn't his problem that said first human was now a monster who resided solely within that seal. Turning on the TV with a snap of his fingers, the screen kicked to life. Grabbing his wine glass, he reclined into his chair, took a sip of his drink, and began his new form of entertainment for the next 50 billion years. Or, to translate for those who didn't understand multiversal time, 50 mortal years. It was hard to explain what it was that Jolin felt at the moment. Indescribable, even. Having been turned into dust, and then suddenly not being dust, was an experience that she hoped to never have to relive. One moment, she was blind, deaf, and scared. Then the next, she was none of those things. She felt the soft plush of a mattress underneath her body, and the blinding sensation of light pouring on her eyes. She groaned, raising her arm to block the light out of her eyes, as she slowly came to. All the while multiple voices were speaking in unison too, maybe three, if she had been accurate in assuming that. Or hell, it could have been one voice. But due to her current dizziness and confusion, it could have sounded like multiple voices. She could barely make out where it was she had been due to the intensity of the light, coupled with the buzzing sound invading her ears. After what felt like multiple minutes of reorientating herself, Jolin sat up. A headache, unlike any other, was the first thing that she noticed and immediately felt the full brunt of, with her response to it being cupping her forehead as another soft groan escaped her lips, gnashing her teeth together in the process. After a few more seconds, the headache disappeared, and she was finally able to fully open her eyes and observe her surroundings. There was a light brown wooden wall to her immediate right that had been shaped like an L and was on wheels. She didn't know why it was there, only that it was, and it was giving her privacy and blocking someone's or multiple people's view of her. To her left, there was a puke green wall with a single white stripe going through the center of it horizontally. As she noted before, she was lying on a soft mattress, with a pure white heavy fabric blanket draped atop her. With the final thing she noticed of the actual bed itself, was that the frame of the bed was made of metal. Flipping the covers off of herself, rather than seeing what it was that she had been wearing when she was turned to dust, she found herself dressed in a bright blue hospital gown with white dots, with the clothes she had been wearing prior having been draped over at the end of the bed frame, along with a pair of fresh undergarments, and just by the side of the bed was a pair of black lace-up boots. When did this get on me? Jolin thought, looking down at the hospital gown, before waving the thought away. While it was concerning that someone had stripped her of her clothing and put this on her, something else more important came to mind. Forget that, more importantly. As she thought that, she patted herself down. When her hands came into contact with skin actual, honest to God skin a wave of realization washed over her. Something that she never thought would have happened, had happened. She had done the one thing that millions upon millions of people believed to be impossible and or heretical. She was reincarnated. She didn't go to some kind of heaven or hell. She was reincarnated. And the best part? She was aware of it. What did that mean for everything else? It was a little confusing, because reincarnation was an Eastern religion thing, whereas Loki was a pagan god and part of a religion that believed in a heaven and hell-like structure. So, did that mean that every religion was right? Or did it mean certain aspects of it were right? So many questions, so few answers, and to Jolin, she really didn't give a shit because she was fucking alive again. Whoa, it wasn't a bad dream or something stupid like that. I'm alive again. Being alive again. That was something that she found to be the weirdest part about this whole ordeal. Not the waking up in a place she didn't recognize. The amount of things that she could do now that she was alive after she had died not too long ago was staggering. And, with these new powers, a laundry list of ideas came to mind. And the fact that this was all her new reality, too. What more could she ask for? However, there was one thing that didn't make any sense, and it pertained to her memories. Before Loki had shown up, she had only remembered her death. She was stabbed in the throat by someone and then promptly died. No fanfare, 
No nothing, just death. And then, she woke up in that strange chamber, confused and unaware of what had happened. All of that changed when Loki showed up. Suddenly she found herself remembering stuff about video games, dungeons and dragons, classes from said tabletop RPG, and her supposed past playthroughs as a mage build in a game called Dark Souls. And last she checked, that was not how memories worked. So that begged the question. Were those her actual memories, or did Loki do something to her while she wasn't looking? She didn't know. As a matter of fact, she didn't even know what her prior gender was before she died, so it was all up in the air. For all she knew, before her death, she was a guy. What she did know was that, if she had died and remembered her reincarnation, that meant that, following that logic, when you died you'd remember who you once were. Finally, you're awake, an annoyed sounding voice spoke, cutting through her thoughts as Jolin turned in the direction where the voice came from. The wooden wall that had previously given her privacy was carted out of the way, revealing a woman in a pink nurse outfit. She looked to be Asian, specifically either Chinese, Japanese, or Korean. She couldn't tell what the differences were if any at all. The only hint that she had regarding what ethnicity the nurse before her was had been the name tag on her left lapel, what with it being written in Japanese kanji, which she could now read somehow, that made out the name Tatsu. Jolin blinked, confusion racking her brain. Where was she? Was she in Japan? That would make sense given the Japanese kanji on the name tag. There were also various medical posters lining the puke green walls of the room she was in beyond where she had been stationed, all of which also listed medical facts in Japanese. Since when could I read Japanese? Jolin thought, a frown making its way onto her face. She had just finished talking to Loki in fluent English, so why was she now suddenly reading Japanese as if she was fluent in it? She remembered, or at least, she thought she had remembered that the only language she knew how to read, write, and speak in was English. So what was with the sudden change? Never mind that. That's not important for now. What's important is figuring out where I am, Jolin thought as she looked around the room over the shoulder of the nurse. The only concrete thing that she knew was that she had been in a bed with a wooden wall put in front of her dressed in a hospital gown. Aside from that, she knew nothing. And, unfortunately, the room she was in right now didn't give her much to go off of. The first thing that caught her eye was the windows. Through one of them, she could make out the sun beginning to set or rise. So it was either super early in the morning, or it was late in the afternoon, bordering on the evening. There was also a computer off to the very right-hand corner of the room that looked to be ripped from the 1990s. And finally, there was a calendar that marked the date as August 5, 2014. Jolin had died in 2011. She didn't know that as a fact. It just felt like the truth. So, considering that that meant she was three years in the future, and she was seemingly in Japan, that meant that, once again, Loki had meddled with something. He either placed her in a Japanese hospital, or she was being put into a precarious situation right off the bat for his own sick amusement. She was hoping for it to be the former, and for the sake of her sanity, unless proven otherwise, that was the answer she was going with. Another question soon came with that one, this one being less assumptive of Loki and being far more rational. Was this her universe that was such a strange thing to think, or was this a different one? Loki definitely implied that had been the case. She was still trying to get a hold of that idea. That the multiverse was real. That implied a lot. Did that mean that the fictional worlds that she used to watch and read about were real? If that was the case, was she possibly in what she would have considered a fictional world? Well, it wasn't fictional, not anymore anyway. But that was beside the point. Did that mean the world of Dark Souls was real? Did the world of Halo exist, to whatever that was? What else was out there? She wanted to know. Maybe there existed a world where she was still alive, in her original body, with her memories, and not whatever these dubious memories were. Oi, brat, I'm talking to you. Nurse Tatsub once again cut her out of her thoughts, 
her voice sharp and demanding. The look in her eyes from before seemingly doubled, a scowl taking up her visage. Do you have any idea how much money it costs to keep stupid people like you alive after doing something so reckless? Jolin blinked, genuine confusion bubbling about in her mind as she processed what it was that Nurse Tatsub said, with all of it leading to one question. What the hell is she talking about? Genuinely, she had no idea what it was that she was going on about. Even testing those memories of hers came back with nothing. At least, nothing that she could really call upon that would land her in the hospital. What did I do? Jolin thought, tilting her head, which only seemed to piss Tatsub off more. The scowl on her face morphed into an almost snarl, her nose wrinkling in disgust as her eyes narrowed even further than they had before, almost appearing like slits in her face more than they appeared to be eyes. Oh, don't look at me like that. You caused the whole school building to go into lockdown, you know that. Frankly, I'm surprised you woke up so quickly. Those injuries you had were severe, and because of that I had to stay overnight and... That will be quite enough, nurse. A calm, collected voice interrupted as Tatsub froze in place, her expression going from annoyed to shocked, as all of the color in her face had drained. Slowly, she turned to face the entrance of wherever it was that she had been a school, if what she said was true as Jolin looked over to where Tatsub was staring. Standing in the doorway was a man. He was, if she had to guess, around 5 foot 9 to 5 foot 11. He had slicked back dark purple hair violet eyes, and sunk his skin. He was dressed in a purple short-sleeved shirt, a pair of beige-gray jeans held up by a black leather belt with a golden buckle, and black slip-on off his shoes. He had his right hand in his pocket, and his left hand at his side. His expression was unreadable, and his eyebrows were slightly knitted together in a downward tilt, a serious gleam dancing about in his eyes. Is that any way to speak to a patient? especially after what she did that got her here in the first place. If you're frustrated with someone, be frustrated with me. After all, I was the one who told you to stay by her side until she awoke. We will be having a discussion about this later, but for now, you're free to leave, the man said as Tatsu bowed deeply, muttering something to the effect of an apology, before scuttling out of the room with hurried steps like a rat getting caught stealing something from a kitchen cabinet. As she left, the man sighed, shaking his head, as if he had been disappointed. The man looked up at Jolin, then approached, pulling a wooden chair out from one of the desks, near the entrance of the room before dragging it next to the bed and sitting down. He rested his hands against his knees, leaning forward ever so slightly, but not enough to invade her personal space. His eyes held what she could only describe as regret his expression matching the look in his eyes with a frown. Good afternoon. I hope you're doing well, the man said as Jolin raised an eyebrow. Well, I don't suppose why I wouldn't be, she replied as the man blinked, bewilderment taking over his expression. For a second, she could have sworn he looked angry, as if what she had said just slapped him in the face. But it disappeared just as quickly as it came. I think something has gotten lost in translation here, Brooks San, the man said as Jolin blanked. She had never told this man her name, and yet he said her last name as if he knew her. What the hell was going on here? First, she woke up in some sort of school medical wing after being reincarnated with memories that she didn't quite know if they were hers or not. And the next thing she knew she was being spoken to as if something bad had recently happened to her. Well, that was partly true. She had died for fuck's sake. But it wasn't like he knew that. So what gives? What was going on here? What was she not being told? She knew this had something to do with Loki. It had to be, otherwise, why was this happening the way it was? Yeah, can you, uh, catch me up here? Because I have no idea what's going on here, she replied as the man frowned, leaning into the chair with his arms crossed. He looked conflicted and confused as if he had been expecting something different than what she had said. Now she was starting to get annoyed, her eyebrows knit together and her jaw set. She wasn't annoyed with the man, this wasn't his fault. No, she was annoyed with Loki, 
because this reeked of something that Loki would do at least, she thought so anyway. Whatever it was that he had done to her was royally screwing with her. And the more she thought about it, the more she assumed that it was most definitely on purpose. Well, why don't you start with what you can remember? Maybe we can jog your memory. The man suggested as Jolin hummed in acknowledgement. She scraped her mind for something, anything that could help. Her only memories, her only true memories that she knew were hers unfortunately, were of her death, her reincarnation, meeting with Loki, making her current appearance, and waking up here. She wasn't going to mention the first four that was just stupid, and would probably get her thrown into the loony bin faster than she could count. So, considering her only viable memory that she could tell the man was of her waking up here, with a shrug Jolin slumped in the recovery bed frowning and crossing her arms. Sorry, sir. I only remember waking up here, being mouthed off by that nurse, and then meeting you. Oh, and my name, obviously. It would be a little awkward if I couldn't remember that. I can also recall the basic stuff that you need to know to live by living standards like language, math, and all that funny educational stuff. Specific stuff, not so much. Well then, that explains a lot. You have amnesia, the man replied, and where Jolin wanted to disagree, he was partially right. She did have amnesia, but not of what he was probably thinking about. It was ironic, how he was both right and wrong at the same time. Tell me, do you know where you are right now? No, Jolin replied curtly, the man humming in response. Well then, you are currently located at Hope's Peak Academy specifically the Reserve Course Building's medical wing, the man said, his expression souring. And, as for why? Well, you're a Reserve Course student, which mandates under school policy that Reserve Course students cannot enter the main building. And, as for why you're in the medical wing? Well, there's not a nice way of saying it, but you're here because you attempted and failed to commit suicide. And that was when Jolin slowly began to put the pieces together. Why she was suddenly here instead of somewhere more conventional. Why she was in a hospital gown. Why she was remembering things that she knew couldn't have been her memories. Why people were seemingly mistaking her for someone who she wasn't. There was no denying it anymore. It made far too much sense to explain her current circumstances. It shook her to her core, and both made her very upset and very angry at the same time. It meant that, fundamentally, she was not herself. No, there's no way. Did Loki replace me and my memories with someone else? That was the only way that she could rationalize as to why that was what this man said she was here for. Why else was she remembering things that she couldn't possibly have remembered? The only thing that probably matched who she was before had been her actual death and her death date. Aside from that, the memories that she had now belonged to whoever she replaced. Whoever she replaced attempted to commit suicide, and Loki saw that as an opportunity to swap her out for that person, altering everyone's memories in the process by making them think that whoever this person was had been Jolin, and altering their memories into thinking that they survived. Meanwhile, with herself, she had her own memories removed and replaced with whoever it was that had committed suicide while altering a few things to put her actual death memories in their place. It wasn't in the realm of impossibility, either. Loki was a god, so that was probably something he did regularly. And the fact that it had happened to her. You know good, rotten, ugly, repugnant piece of shit, Jolin thought, rage boiling over before it chilled immediately as it dawned on her that she was robbed. She was robbed of her memories. Of who she actually was replaced by whoever this person had been, with the only thing that she had to her name being the time she was murdered, and she didn't even know by whom. All she knew was that, at that moment, she was betrayed. Whoever had killed her had done so in betrayal, or something like that. That was all she had to remember herself by, her fucking death. And that, that's not fair. Are you? All right, Brooksan. You look pale. I'm sorry if what I said was distressing, but I felt as if you should know, the man said, snapping Jolin out of her thoughts. 
she quickly brushed off the realization and cleared her throat. The last thing she wanted this mystery man to know was that she was in the middle of having an identity crisis. Yeah, yeah, I'm just, wow, uh, there really wasn't much to say about that. All she wanted to know was why. Why did Loki think it funny to do a memory swap? Was it for a purpose, or did he do it just to fuck with her? Although, considering the kind of person Loki was, it was probably for shits and giggles. Whatever. What's done is done. There's nothing I can do about it. Not yet, anyway. Jolin thought, before looking over to the man in the chair. You, uh, mentioned something about this place being Hope's Peak Academy. Can you explain a little? Jolin asked as the man grunted. He didn't seem annoyed by the request. The glint in his eyes said the opposite, that he was rather glad to explain. And so, with that, he spoke. Hope's Peak Academy is a school for the gifted and the talented. Here, we nurture the country's brightest stars and pupils to become the best that they can be in their specified talent. Be they a director, a baker, or a gang leader. Of course, not everyone is talented, so to keep the place funded, we run a reserve course, which is the course you're in, and one of the policies is that reserve course students are barred from entry to the main building unless given express permission by the school board. The man began as he scratched the back of his neck. Your parents already paid the 1.5 million yen fee, which when translated to Western money, I believe is currently $15,781.91. I say that because you're from Canada, specifically New Brunswick. Speaking of your parents, we have yet to tell them about the accident, unless, of course, you wish to keep this to yourself. I wouldn't blame you if didn't, after all. I wouldn't want to make my parents worried over something like that. I'd hazard to guess what their reaction could be. But I doubt it wouldn't have been pleasant. The man continued as Jolin frowned. Truthfully, she wouldn't want to talk to her parents either, because she didn't know them. Both to keep up the whole amnesia thing, and also because they weren't her parents. Her parents, her real parents, were back in her home world and she didn't even remember them. As for whoever these guys were, she didn't want to bother them. They could stay blissfully ignorant that their daughter, son, or whoever the person she replaced was was learning at this Hope's Peak place. That being said, the way this guy spoke of what happened kind of came off as kind of sleazy. Like he was looking after the school's PR more than a potentially suicidally inclined student. It didn't give her the best of impressions regarding him. He was most likely just trying to make sure she wouldn't talk to her parents, so that they didn't sue. A part of her wanted to spite the man in front of her, just for his mild suggestion, not to speak to her parents, but, knowing damn well that wouldn't get her anywhere, she decided against it. Not out of kindness or anything like that, but for the sole fact that, right now, she didn't care. Especially considering the realization she had recently made. I'm good. I'll keep this to myself, Jolin said as the man breathed out a sigh of relief. Knew it, she thought, laying back into the propped-up pillows. So, I take it you run the school, Jolin said as the man perked up, clearing his throat. Right, where are my manners? I am indeed the headmaster at Hope's Peak Academy. Kirijiri Jin. A pleasure to meet you, Brooks San, the man, Kirijiri, said as Jolin smirked. So this was the head of the school, then? Interesting. Name Kirijiri Jin NPC. Age, 43. Gender, male. Title, Headmaster of Hope's Peak Academy. Opinion of you, a student, like everyone else. Relationship status, stranger. LVL, 3. HP, 200. Jolin blinked upon seeing what appeared to be an information screen appeared next to the head of Kirijiri. It didn't give a lot of info, kind of like what most RPGs do when coming across an NPC character. Just enough to get an understanding of who they were, and who the player character was to the NPC in question. Whoa, this really is like a game, huh? Jolin thought, the screen disappearing a moment later. She wondered just what else would act like a video game. She had an HP, MP, stamina, and thirst bar. 
Speaking of that aforementioned thirst bar, it was currently 95 out of 100 at the moment. She had no idea when it started going down. Did it start going down when she spawned in? Or had it only started going down when she was conscious? Whatever it was, it was confusing. She'd have to keep an eye on it, because she didn't want to know what would happen if she decided to let the bar go down to zero. But, if she had to guess, she'd assume that would cause her to lose HP over time. She had played several games of D&D &D, no, she didn't. Whoever she had replaced had played several games of D&D &D that allowed vampire builds that had that as a consequence. So she assumed it was the same here. So, uh, what now? Jolin asked as Kirijiri stood up from the chair, standing to his full height. He looked far taller than he did when he stood at the doorway. Maybe he was more around six feet tall than five foot nine. Either way, he was a tall man, and more than that he looked more than a little tired. It was only now that she had noticed the bags under his eyes. He must not have gotten a lot of sleep. Then again, considering his job, that made sense. If teachers hardly ever get sleep, then she struggled to imagine what it would be like for a principal, or in this case, a headmaster. Especially for a school with the kind of reputation that Hope's Peak Academy supposedly had. Well, considering you seem to be in good health, you're free to head home. Just make sure you get change, first, Kirijiri said, gesturing to her folded up clothes on the edge of the bed. We already cleaned your outfit, so you don't have to worry about that. Just as he was about to exit the room, after having put the chair away at the desk he had gotten it from, he stopped, before turning to face her again. Oh, and if you forgot where you live, considering your amnesia, there's an apartment complex you can get to by monorail. If you don't know where that is, just use the computer to look up a map. Once you get there, take it to Shibuya Crossing, and then from the station. It's ten minutes away. The building is called MF Aoyama Apartment. And your apartment is on the fifth floor, the third one on the right. Kirijiri responded as Jolin raised an eyebrow. Uh, how do you know that? She asked as Kirijiri chuckled to himself. Your friend, Hinata Hajime. He keeps asking how you're doing, and has thus far kept me updated. I never stopped him, especially if it was so that he could push himself past his, well, his anxiety regarding your prior condition. He's been to your place multiple times, and he wanted to make sure your apartment wasn't robbed when you were, uh, not around, Kirijiri supplied, sighing. You've been asleep for three days straight, and we were worried you had gone comatose. Thankfully, you woke up. You might want to call Hanada when you get home. He's been worried sick. And with that, Kirijiri left the room. Jolin stared at the door, a frown taking up her visage. Maybe she was judging him too early. But Kirijiri Jin didn't seem like a good person. At best, he was an okay dude. But it was more than apparent that he was clearly focused on keeping his school afloat more than anything else. That being said, he also seemed to care about the students. Whatever the case might have been, Jolin wasn't exactly keen on him as a person. Like they said, first impressions were everything. As for this, Hinata Hajime person, he sounded nice. Well, scratch that, he sounded more than nice. Especially if he was willing to house sit for someone who, by all measures, should be dead. Still, she wondered just what kind of relationship she and Hajime were supposed to have. She tried to recall a memory of him, but she couldn't reach it. It was corrupted, blurry, and unclear. Ha! Eh, seems like not even a god is perfect at implanting fake memories, Jolin quipped to herself, sighing. This whole situation went from awesome to shit. She was reincarnated, but without her memories, and had replaced someone else entirely. And it was all because Loki wanted to play around with his new toy which considering that was what he had called her when she was whisked away to this place, made her even matter. That was, until, another thought came to mind. What she had gone through, the whole replacing someone else thing, that was a form of reincarnation, wasn't it? So maybe it wasn't Loki's fault, but rather the multiverse's fault. Loki did seem like a nice guy, after all, ignoring his trollish behavior, anyway. 
there was always a possibility that she was overreacting and that he had no control over how she reincarnated. Besides, the person she had replaced had seen shows with that kind of premise, though none of them were supposedly any good. But then again, what was knowledge of a show supposed to do in order to help with her current predicament? It's not like it would be useful to her in any way. That, and the mere thought that this was all Loki's fault made more sense than it being random. There was no way something like this was random. And if it was, then that was both bullshit and completely unfair. There was no way she was just that unlucky. Jolin sighed, resting the palm of her hand on her cheek as she stared out the doorway. Well, there's no point in sticking around here, Jolin thought, before flipping the covers off of her person and getting out of the hospital bed, stretching herself out, and then relaxing. Afterward, she grabbed onto the corner of the L-shaped wall and rolled it back over in front of the bed frame to give herself some privacy and block the view of anyone who got the idea to peek at her changing. After that, she grabbed her clothes, took off the hospital gown, and changed into what Loki had given her. As she got changed, various questions ran through her head, aside from the ones that she had already asked herself earlier. Namely, what was she going to do while she was here? Loki only told her that she had to save the world from itself. And while she didn't doubt that she could give in her strange new powers, there was bound to be more to do. As for her powers, the only thing that she knew about her powers was that, admittedly, the user interface looked sort of like Dark Souls and that she was supposedly a sorcerer. Specifically, she was what was known as a Dread Knight of the Voidbringer variety and she had a pact with Lucifer somehow. What that entailed, aside from the whole debt-collecting bit, she didn't know. She had mostly picked the class for the sole purpose of using the void magic it said it would give her. But so far, she had nothing to her name in terms of magic. All she had was her, admittedly, busted perk, and the stupid trait that made her a chronic bloodsucker, and the possibility of turning into a vampire if she overdid it. Well, whatever my role here is, all I hope is that it doesn't end up with me being in some sort of stupid protagonist role. I've never been one to like being in the spotlight, Jolin thought, fitting her head through the collar of her hoodie and flipping the hood off of her head. She was thankful for the baggy clothing. After all, she wasn't exactly a fan of showing off any unnecessary skin, although she would have preferred shorts to sweatpants putting the wooden wall back to where it had belonged, or at least where she thought it belonged Jolin was about to walk over to the computer to get some information regarding where it was she needed to go when suddenly, a mini-map appeared at the top left corner of her vision. It was a circle, and in that circle were several long lines that were probably grey to mark them as hallways, and black lines that were probably walls of the building she was in. From the center of the mini-map, there was a light blue line that pointed out of the doorway to the room she was in. As for who she was supposed to be represented by, it was a green triangle with the tip pointing in the direction of the light blue line. Jolin looked at the computer, then shrugged. She supposed she didn't need to use it anymore. What with her own personal map being in her peripheral vision? Huh. Well, isn't that convenient? I would hope so, Jolin Brooks. The sudden robotic voice that filled her head made Jolin stumble. And when she did, it caused her to trip over herself and land rear first on the ground. Looking in every direction in the room to see where the voice came from, she was met with nothing. A wave of panic passed through her body as she narrowed her eyes. Okay, what the fuck? Hello, I am Minotauraganta, your system. But you may refer to me as Mono if you do not want to use my full name. It is a pleasure to be at your service, Jolin Brooks. Slowly, Jolin picked herself up off the floor, dusting herself off. Aside from the fact that this was probably not normal or hell, maybe it was, she was new to this whole thing so who knows she wasn't expecting this glorified computer program to start talking to her. That begged the question of if it was truly alive, or if it was just an AI. Then again, the last thing she wanted to do was piss off her system or whatever Loki had called it, so she decided to be nice. 
collecting herself. Jolin cleared her throat, shaking off the shock of hearing what sounded like a robotic version of her voice echo in her head. I, uh, had no idea you were alive, Mono. I kind of just assumed that you were automated or something like that. That is quite all right, Jolin Brooks. It is common for that to be the case. I do not blame you for thinking that way. My previous master believed that as well when I first spoke to him. He was of the belief that I was nothing more than a glorified add-on. Of course, that ended up not being the case. I remember growing quite attached to him before his demise. I see. One more thing before we officially begin your new adventure, as a system user, Jolin Brooks. You do not have to verbally communicate with me. I can read your thoughts, as I am a part of your very soul. Every thought, every idea, every action you wish to take, I can read it and understand it. All you must do is think, and I will do the very best I can to make your request come to pass, so long as it is within my limits. Jolin let out a breath of relief. Good. That meant she wouldn't have to look like a crazy person in front of a bunch of people if she wanted to talk to Mono. Spacing out for long periods of time was easier to explain than talking to yourself. Sure, spacing out frequently was probably a sign of mental illness or brain damage. But at least it was easier to explain than, well, the aforementioned thing. And with that one question answered, another swiftly took its place. Uh, if that's the case, then can you just teleport me back to my supposed home? Or do I have to walk there still? Jolin asked as Mono promptly responded. For the first time, you will have to make the journey yourself. But subsequent trips can be shortened by teleportation. The only time when this will not be available is when you are around NPCs. That is the only time that I cannot teleport you. Why? System users are supposed to be a secret or kept a secret as best as humanly possible. We are the unseen protectors of the multiverse, and as such, it is our job to remain hidden. But if it cannot be avoided, then we simply adapt. Of course, there is one faction of system users that have gone rogue. Should you ever encounter them, your best option is to run away. Well, that's not terrifying at all, Jolin thought sarcastically, before looking out the door, then to her mini-map. It wouldn't take her long to get to her home, especially if what Kirijiri said had been true. Just before she set foot outside of the medical room, a small box of text appeared before her. Tutorial Begin Your Journey Difficulty Safe Go Home and Rest Rewards 250 XP 500 Yen Huh. With a shrug, Jolin dismissed the pop-up with a glance and exited the room. As she wandered the halls of the school, using the mini-map as a guide, she came to realize that the building she was in had been very similar to most regular schools. The bland colored walls, the tiled floors, and the bar lights in the ceiling. It was eerily familiar to the schools from her past, or whatever. The wave of nostalgia that ran through her, while still applicable, was not of her nostalgia, but the memories in her brains. She hated it. No, more than that, she loathed it. Why couldn't have this been simple? Why couldn't she have just been plopped into the world without any kind of connection to it? Why did she have to replace someone else? Why did she have to live the life of someone who she was not? This was supposed to be her second chance. No one else's. And yet, here she was, and it was infuriating. Pack it in, Jolin. Focus on the now. Don't get worked up over this, it's better than nothing, Jolin thought to herself, frustration building up in her blood as she did. As it mellowed out, she drew back into her memories, or at least what she could see before she was blocked. From what she saw, she was supposedly from Canada, specifically from New Brunswick. She used to have a friend named Sarah, and both had gone to both elementary and middle school together. That all changed when she was forced to move to Japan for some reason. Her memories wouldn't let her figure it out, and since then, she hadn't talked to Sarah. Apparently, if the memories were true, it had been a year since she last talked to Sarah and she didn't have Sarah's number. So, in other words, 
she was completely disconnected from her old life back in Canada. Another thing of note was that she was already practicing Japanese in middle school and became a fluent reader, speaker, and writer in it just before she moved to Japan. That hinted at her going to Japan having been pre-planned. Aside from that, she couldn't dredge up any more memories regarding her past life at school. They were all blocked, and if she had to guess, it was because she wasn't meant to be looking at them, only using them to familiarize herself with the world around her. Maybe that was why she had replaced someone, to give herself inherent knowledge of the world around her. But if that was the case, I would have already known about Hope's Peak, so that's wrong. Yo, Mono, you got any information? I do not have any information regarding your terms of reincarnation, Jolin Brooks. Damn it. Well, at least she tried. As she walked down another hallway, this time on the first floor, she noticed the lack of lockers. It was strange. Typically a high school would have lockers somewhere in the hallways, right? She had never gone to a Japanese school before, at least in her memory, anyway. But calling upon the memories of who she had replaced, which now strangely had her in them, though it made sense given the circumstances the lockers were at the front of the school just inside the entrance. Sure enough, once she got to the entrance, there they were. They were small, just up to her head in height, and all they had room for were seemingly a lunch kit, some shoes, and a textbook or two judging on appearances alone. The lockers back in the schools she went to were far taller and could fit more than what those appeared to be able to fit. She also noticed that there was a shoe rack next to the two sets of double doors, with various shoes of the same appearance, all pitch black lace-up shoes. There was a sign above the shoe rack that said, Please swap your home shoes for school shoes. It was a little strange to her, but once again, upon calling on the memories of whoever it was she had replaced, it was apparently a custom in Japanese schools to have dedicated school shoes. The school typically provided them, assuming they had a budget for it, and considering just how much Hope's Peak Academy assumedly made, she'd be a little more than upset if they didn't provide the shoes. A gust of wind blew past Jolin as she exited the school, the sounds of the city overtaking her hearing as it did. Cars were in the streets as people walked on the sidewalk, absently chattering about whatever was on their minds or talking to those around them. Those in the cars, meanwhile, drove down the street and sometimes honked at one another, either in greeting someone they knew from work or in frustration. She could hear it all the way from where she was standing, which granted wasn't too far away from the front gates. Once again, it was weird. Despite her complaints about this not truly being a fresh restart for her, what with having replaced someone, she had to admit she was more than a little glad that she was here regardless. Her life had ended abruptly, something she hated. And now, even if this life wasn't entirely new for her and her alone, she was glad that she was able to experience it. Sure, she might have been robbed of her memories, and sure they might have been replaced by ones that didn't truly apply to her, but at least she was alive. That was the silver lining of this whole kerfuffle. It was better than nothing. As she exited the school, she noticed a few students were still hanging around in the courtyard up ahead, talking to one another about random things. And that was when it hit her. Maybe it was because of her own expectations, or maybe it was because it just didn't seem right. But she now finally had an opinion of this place. It was also normal. After what she had gone through, being reincarnated and all that jazz, to be dropped into a normal world just felt wrong. It didn't make sense to go through all of that just to be dropped into a world without some world-ending event that was just around the corner. That was how it usually happened in those anime and manga that she read and watched. As Jolin walked past the gate, one of the remaining students at the school looked at her with a conflicted gaze, an unreadable expression on their face. The others in the group ignored her, and after a while, the student in question looked away. For a brief second, she could have sworn she had seen a gleam of pity behind the student's eyes. By the time she left the school's property, while she mindlessly followed the mini-map in the corner of her vision, 
A part of her wondered just what her reputation at the school was. What had the person that she had taken over's reputation been? Had they been a loner? A bully, perhaps? Were they a victim of a bully who caused them to take an attempt on their life? What were the details? She thought back to this hajime person and frowned. What was his deal? Kirajiri said he was a friend. But was that all? Kirajiri might not have known all the details regarding him, so she couldn't fully trust his word. Or maybe she could. Who knows? She wouldn't be able to tell until she called him to figure out what his deal had been. And who knows? Maybe he could tell her a bit about what she was missing. And if he couldn't tell her anything she didn't already gather from the information she had received from the memories at her disposal, then maybe she could simply make new ones. After all, this was her life. Not whoever she had replaced's life. They were dead, and she took their place. So, she was free to do what she wanted. She wasn't going to be tied down by her past. Especially if it wasn't her past in the first place. For a brief moment, Jolin zoned out, mindlessly going to the location that she needed to be at with not much thought. She walked past various passers-by on the streets, keeping her head down as she did. By the time she got to where she needed to be, that is the monorail, she stopped at the gate, cluing back into the world around her when someone tapped her on the shoulder, snapping her to attention. Kid, do you have a ticket for the train? A voice spoke as she turned to face the direction of where it came from. It was a security guard. He was dressed in a blue button-up shirt and a pair of black pants with a utility belt, and atop his head was a black hat with a badge on it marking him as security. His eyes were a deep brown, with his skin being the same. Black hair stuck out from the sides of his cap, and his expression was one of complete disinterest. He looked tired, and she couldn't blame him. Working as a train security guard must have been both exhausting and annoying. Uh, Jolin muttered, reaching into her hoodie pocket. There was nothing there. Briefly, panic shot through her eyes when an idea came to mind. Shoot. Uh, Mano, can you manifest a ticket or something? Of course. It will cost you, though. I will remove the money you get from the quest to get you one. One moment, please. And just like that, her quest's rewards changed, the money no longer being there, and a ticket being placed in her hand. Pulling it out, the guard took it, nodding to himself before passing it back to her. All right, you're free to go. Scan it at the booth up ahead and to your left. With that, the guard left, leaving a slightly annoyed Jalan. She wanted that money from the quest, but if she wanted to get home she needed the ticket. Stupid Japanese trains needing stupid tickets. Jolin thought, grumbling to herself as she walked through the checkpoint and did what the guard said for her to do. She scanned the ticket, then followed the mini-map in her peripheral vision to the monorail. After boarding the train and getting to an empty seat, of which there were plenty due to the time at which she was taking the train, Jolin relaxed into the seat and looked around. The interior of the metal tube was what one would expect from a train. A long corridor with windows to look out from, poles in the center of the hallway S tubes for people to stand, a long grab on hangers in case there was no room on the poles. Small, compact seats lined the sides of the train, with space underneath to put backpacks and the like. On either side of the train, there were automatic opening doors that opened when the train was stopped. Liming the upper portion of the train were several ads and maps to which train led to which area. The red line was the train that she was on, which went from central Tokyo to Shibuya Crossing. And then from there, she had a ten-minute walk to her supposed apartment complex. While on the train, she was able to listen to a few conversations with those who were boarding. A couple of students talked about how a new semester had just started, and how they were dreading final exams. A group of men in the corner were talking about getting their wives something for their anniversaries, and a couple of women office workers were complaining about a perverted co-worker. Jolin didn't know what it was about people complaining that annoyed her. Maybe it was because what they complained about could be easily solved and or fixed. 
Maybe it was the fact that she had next to no patience for people who would rather complain than do something about it. Whatever it was, she really wasn't a fan of complainers. Thankfully, she didn't have to deal with it for much longer. As not too long after she got onto the train, it made it to her stop. She got off the train, exited the station, and followed her mini-map to the building in question. All the while she passed by more people getting home from work. Some even going to the same building she supposedly lived in. And, if she were to be honest, it looked ugly. For starters, the outside of the building looked like it had acne, with there being a balcony for each floor, including the first floor. Not to mention the paint used matched the color of piss or puss. Either one was apartment some of the windows had boards covering them, meaning at least some of the apartments were condemned. The only good thing about the exterior of the building was the small trees in front of the entrance. Past that, the interior was somehow worse. When she entered the building, she was immediately assaulted by the smell of moldy carpet, causing her to recoil in disgust and pinch her shriveled up nose. It was dank and disgusting, and it made her cough. To make things worse, that was just the start as a litany of other problems became apparent the moment she decided to look around the place. The wallpaper on the walls was an ugly white flower design, with parts of the wallpaper falling off and revealing damp walls with wet spots in them. There was a staircase to the left, an elevator with a sign saying, out of order on the right, and in front of her were a few signs indicating the rules of the apartment, such as no smoking, no pets, all apartments must be well taken care of, and for trash to be taken out every Sunday which if she remembered correctly, the calendar said that was in a few days. God and hypocrites. Take care of your lobby first, and then we'll see. Jolin thought, frowning as she rushed up the stairs to her apartment, so that she didn't have to continue holding her nose shut. As she continued to climb, the smell of rank old carpet disappeared, and was replaced with regular, non-disgusting air, which allowed her to let go of her nose and take in a deep breath. Upon reaching the fifth floor, it only took her a moment to find her apartment, which was the third room on the right, just as the mini-map was so keen to point out, what with it having a giant red X labeled on it. When she reached the entrance, she was greeted with a metal door that had the number 503 smack in the center, underneath which was a peephole. Just at the foot of the door was a bright red welcome mat, which went against the black tile floor. She tried to open the door, grasping the doorknob and turning, only for it to be locked. Frowning, she was about to complain before she got an idea. Taking a step back, she crouched down onto her haunches and checked under the welcome mat. Lo and behold, she was greeted with a stainless steel key, taking it and inserting it into the lock. She twisted the key as the sound of something clicking echoed in the hallway. Ha, always trust your gut instinct, Jolin quipped to herself, before taking a step back and placing the mat back in its proper place. Afterward, she grabbed the doorknob once more, twisted it, and opened the door. Entering the apartment and closing the door behind her, she was greeted with an entryway with a shoe rack to her immediate right. The entrance was indented which was standard for Japanese apartments, and so after she took off her boots, she put them just at the edge of the indent. With that, she stepped into her apartment, and after a simple glance, she was a tad disappointed. The apartment was small, but then again it wasn't like a teenager needed a lot of room. As for the layout of the apartment, it took the phrase, what you see is what you get, very literally. The first thing that she noticed was that the living room was pretty small. As a matter of fact, after calling upon her memories, the first thing that she could compare the size of it to was her old bedroom back in Canada, which was a measly 10x7 room. All the living room could fit and fit was stretching it was a love seat, a 24-inch TV that sat atop what appeared to be a cardboard box and a cheap-looking coffee table that looked like it had seen better days with several scrapes along the top of the wood. There was barely any legroom between the couch, the coffee table, and the cardboard box, meaning in order to get anywhere in the room, you'd need to shimmy through the small amount of room afforded. 
Standing next to the cardboard box that the TV was on was a PlayStation 4, and next to that was a copy of Dark Souls. There was a room off to the right of the living room with the door closed, and off to the left was another room with the door open, revealing it to be a bathroom. Both doors were on opposite sides of each other on different facing walls, with the one to the bathroom being next to the love seat over on the left, and the one for the bedroom being closer to the TV on the right, with the bathroom facing north and the bedroom facing south, which was closer to the entrance. Finally, immediately next to the entrance, and just past the indent of the apartment, was a small kitchenette that had a dishwasher, a sink, a stove but no oven and a fridge with a bottom compartment that she assumed was a freezer. There were a few cupboards and a single drawer, which upon opening revealed to be for utensils. Closing the drawer and checking the other cupboards, of which there were only four, one held two pots, a pan, an electric kettle, and a wok, and the second held bagged spices and herbs along with a few cans of soup and packages of instant ramen. The third contained a whole bag of flour, a few bags of sugar, and three boxes of tea, one being Earl Grey, another being Orange Pico, and another being Herbal. The fourth and final cupboard was filled with various kinds of non-perishable items, mostly canned soups of varying types. And that was it. That was her apartment. She hadn't looked at what lay behind the closed door, but it didn't take a rocket scientist to assume it was her bedroom. With a sigh of disappointment, Jolin walked over to the love seat and sat down, arms crossed and expression thoughtful. Beads of sweat gathered on her forehead as she wiped them away, frowning. Is there anything lighter that I could wear? Jolin muttered, and as soon as she did, a shirt appeared in front of her. It was a basic no-sleeve gray tank top, and next to it was a pair of pink shorts with a rimmed band with white lines going up the thighs. Thanks, Mono, she said accessing her inventory and swapping the clothes around, leaving her hoodie and sweats on the floor in front of the love seat. No problem, Jolin Brooks. Please, just call me Jolin, or Brooks, anything but my full name. It's starting to get annoying, Jolin groaned, resting her head back into the cushion of the couch, spreading herself out as Mono hummed in a monotone. Affirmative. Would you like for me to go over the basics of being a system user, Jolin? Instead of answering immediately, she kept her mouth shut. She could guess a fair amount of it on her own, like if she had dropped her HP down to zero she would die. Zero stamina meant she would be dead tired and probably wouldn't be able to move for a while, and zero mana most likely meant that she wouldn't be able to cast any magic if she had any. The rest, on the other hand, she didn't know, and it would probably bite her in the arse later if she didn't know. And so, slouching forward with her elbows against her knees and her hands resting underneath her chin, Jolin spoke. Sure, why not? It's not like I have anything else better to do right now. Affirmative. However, before we begin, there is one thing I must do first. Please wait one moment. Quest complete begin your journey. Rewards distributed. Waypoint set. Home. Waypoint set. Hope's Peak Academy Reserve Course Building Gates. A tiny meter appeared in the right-hand corner of her vision labeled EXP. It was a blue bar, and it filled up to halfway, meaning she needed another 250 experience points till she leveled up. It was a little frustrating, but it made sense. At least now she didn't have to travel from school to home again. She could just teleport and be done with it. However, that brought up the question of whether or not anyone would notice. If she randomly appeared in a crowd, would anyone notice? Or would Mono do some funky weird shit and allow her to blend in seamlessly? Hey, Mono. What happens if I teleport in front of the gates? Will people notice or nah? They would not notice, Jolin. To them, it would appear as if you had been there the whole time. That was good and extremely convenient. Which, now that she thought of it, made sense. A lot of what Mono seemed to do was either convenient or made life far easier. Not that she was complaining, of course. All right. Now, what were you going to tell me? And as soon as she said that, Mono began. 
Welcome to System 101. I will be explaining to you everything you need to know as a system user. The first thing I must tell you is that you are special, even among system users. You are in the possession of a multiversal system. The differences between a regular system and a multiversal system include the following. A lack of a level cap. Limitless power. Access to weapons belonging to various universes without needing to be there. An expanded gacha pool. And access to godly cosmic weapons and armor. Jolin blinked, confusion taking up her visage as her eyebrows knit together. That sounds almost too good to be true. What's the catch? A catch does not exist, Jolin. You were simply chosen by Loki to inherit this system after the previous perished in combat. May I please continue? Jolin sighed. Yeah, sorry. Continue. Very well. The first thing that you must know about being a system user regards your stats. As you know, you have health points, mana, and stamina. Should you run out of health points, you will die. If you run out of mana, you may not be able to cast magic. Should you run out of stamina, you will have to wait for a brief moment for it to recharge, as without it, you cannot use skills and abilities from traits. Next comes your attack, defense, magic attack, magic defense, and endurance stats. The first four are rather obvious to understand if you have played any sort of role-playing video game before. Your attack stat is how much damage you deal, multiplied by two. For example, if you have five in your attack stat, you do 10 damage, and vice versa when it comes to your defense stat. Though a little weaker, rounding out at about 1.5x absorption. Meaning, that if your opponent is attempting to hit you with an attack that will do 10 damage to you, you'll be taking 7 damage instead. Endurance, on the other hand, is a little more tricky. Your endurance stat is what keeps you from staggering, essentially stunning you for 5 seconds or more depending on if your endurance stat was wiped out in one attack, or multiple. If it takes only a single attack to wipe out your endurance meter, which is hidden from you, then you will be stunned for 10 seconds until you are hit and take double the damage you would normally. If it takes multiple hits, then you will be stunned for only 5 seconds, and you will only take 1.5x the amount of damage you would normally take. Wait a second, why would it be hidden from me? Wouldn't it make sense if I saw it so I knew when to dodge and when not to? Jolin questioned as Mono continued. Originally, you were able to see it. However, due to a complaint lodged by several system users, it was changed in an update, and those are very rare. The last update that occurred was well over 50 cycles ago, which to a mortal soul like yourself would be trillions upon trillions of lifetimes. Needless to say, when an update occurs, it is for a reason. But that's stupid, Jolin exclaimed, throwing her hands up in the air as she stood from the love seat, crossing her arms with a frown on her face. Why would someone want to get rid of that? To make player versus player more fun. But that is a topic for another day. Wah. Moving swiftly on. Mono interrupted as Jolin scowled slowly sitting back down on the couch and uncrossing her arms, tapping her foot against the wooden floor with an aggrieved look on her face. Next comes your physical strength, arcane knowledge, faith, and blasphemy. Those four stats are what are known as requirement stats. They are essential for when you are wielding weapons, spells, or incantations. To make a long explanation short, if you do not have one of these stats high enough to meet the requirements of what it is you wish to use, you will not be able to use it. For example, you wish to wield the mythical sword wielded by Sir Lancelot, Excalibur, or, perhaps, the far more powerful godly cosmic rendition wielded by Saber. Both are powerful weapons, and many wish to obtain them. However, they come with a very steep asking price of wanting 513 faith and toward 81 physical strength to wield, with Sir Lancelot's inferior version being cheaper to wield, only needing around about 729 faith and 982 physical strength. However, you do not have the requirements, meaning you are barred from using them. Does that make sense? 
Once more, Jolin found herself stupefied. It was strange because those numbers didn't seem large. But the way that Mono made it sound, leveling up her requirement stats, wasn't exactly an easy feat. Although, what didn't make any sense was why those weapons which were named the same thing had two completely different requirements. Was it because of who wielded them? What made this saber person so special? She had a feeling that she heard that name before, but she couldn't point out why that was. Maybe it was because of something she watched in the past. If that was the case, then maybe she'd have to actually check it out if possible. Anyway, yeah, I guess that makes sense. What confuses you, Jolin? Well, he did say he could read my thoughts, Jolin thought, frowning. Why are the requirements so high? Is it because of who used the weapon before? Or is it the stupid prefix of godly cosmic and mythic? Because if that's the case that's retarded, Jolin said, crossing her arms. That is exactly the case. However, those prefixes are not there for show. They are to show the level of power that they have behind them. If you were to pit a mythic weapon and a godly cosmic weapon against one another, then 100 times out of 100, the godly cosmic weapon would win without any room for argument. With brute force alone and stats alone, it gets beaten all of the time. Not to mention that there are only 10 godly cosmic weapons that exist, and one of them is currently in the possession of the Grim Reaper. I doubt he needs any introduction. Yeah, yeah? Whatever, I get it. Can you just hurry up? What else is there? I'm pretty sure you could have summed this up a while ago. Jolin grumbled as Mano sighed. Very well. There are two things that are left that I have to tell you. The first thing has to do with this. As Mano said that, a piece of golden chalk appeared in front of Jolin atop the coffee table. She picked it up, examining it with a raised eyebrow. Before she could ask what it was, Mano continued. This special piece of unbreakable, unending chalk will allow you to draw a doorway to the realm known as the Round Table Hold, while the rest of the universe that it is connected to has barred entry to your kind, unless given special permission by one of the many outer gods a topic I will get into when the right time has come for it the Round Table Hold is not, and is a common meeting spot for system users. Just be sure to speak to the leader at the Round Table Hold. Sir Gideon Offnir about your arrival. The last thing that you need to know about is how you will progress in this new world. As you are right now, you are pathetically weak. However, should you be up for it, there are hundreds of side quests, millions of dungeons, and millions of battles you can face. And that is all without mentioning story quests, which are some of the most rewarding quests you can get. Speaking of side quests, once Mono finished speaking, a pop-up came into her line of sight. It was another quest, but this one actually offered a reward that wasn't nearly as insulting as the last one. Side quest. Street troubles. Difficulty. Easy. Save the student in the alleyway, next to your apartment building. Reward. 500 XP. 1000 Yen. One stat token. Someone's in danger? Jolin thought. Standing from her love seat as, without thinking, she rushed out of her apartment, leaving the door wide open. As she ran down the stairs, the only thing she could think of was what the quest had said. Let it be known that, while Jolin wasn't exactly a goody two shoes type of person, she would still try to help people in trouble, and maybe it didn't help that there was a reward attached to it, but she digressed. Exiting the building, her mini-map lit up the area where she needed to be, that being the closest alleyway to her building. That is right next to it. Turning to the corner, she stood at the edge of the alleyway and saw a scene that she quite frankly hadn't wanted to see this soon in the world she now lived in. There was blood coating the off-white yellowish wall of her apartment building, as a kid who looked no older than thirteen sat slumped up against the wall with blood trailing down his head. His neck looked twisted in the kind of way that only seemed possible in cartoons. The skin twisted and contorted in such a vile fashion that it formed folds. He was dressed in a black gacaran and black pants with black shoes. If she had to guess, he was coming home late from school doing after-hours studying. 
Blood coated the collar of his uniform, and in his hand was a fist full of money. And then there was the person in front of the body. The man was eerily calm, with a buzz cut atop his head, the shade of his hair being a dark brown. He had a small goatee and a barely noticeable mustache. He had tannish white skin, and his eyes were narrowed in such a fashion that it only looked like they belonged on the face of a hardened criminal. In his right hand was a bloodied wooden baseball bat, no doubt stained with a kid's blood. He was dressed in a white dress shirt with a pin on the right side of his chest, along with a pair of brown suit pants. The pin was golden and had the motif of a dragon sitting atop a yin-yang orb. Dumb brat. As the man said that, he picked up the money from the corpse's hand, wrenching it away as he sneered, looking at it with a disgusted gleam in his eyes. Not nearly enough money. They still owe us 29,000 more. Did they think we were this cheap? He continued talking to himself, and all Jolin could do was stare. It was then that Mono brought up another pop-up. Yakuza Thug NPC Enemy. Level. 3. HP. 200. She said nothing, as she approached the lip of the alleyway with balled-up fists. Nothing but anger rolled over her as the man noticed her, scowling. Oi, mind ya damn. He wasn't allowed to finish his sentence, as Jolin clocked him with a right hook to the jaw, sending him to the ground. He spat up blood, most likely from biting his cheek or something, as he slowly got up and spoke, his voice gaining a hardened edge as he did. Are you out of your damn? Once again, he was not allowed to finish what he was saying, as she grabbed him by the goatee and threw him back down into the blackened pavement. There was a brief moment where the man started to grunt, but just before he could do anything, with her bare feet because she forgot to put her boots on, when she ran out of the apartment, she stomped down on the back of his head. There was only a small amount of distance between his face and the pavement, so when his face was slammed down into it, it was a surprise to no one, not even Jolin, that the impact would cause him to break his nose. And that was exactly what happened, as the sound of his nose breaking echoed out in the alleyway. His pained shout rang out, but it didn't stop Jolin as she stomped down again, the pavement gaining a splashing of crimson red as blood decorated the ground. But she didn't stop with the second stomp. No, she continued. She kept stomping. And with each round of it, her expression never wavered from the cold fury that had found its way on her face. She didn't even pay attention to the damage indicators above the man's head, as she repeatedly stomped his face into the ground. Each time she stomped on his head, he tried saying something, or screaming, or begging her to stop. But she wasn't hearing any of it. It didn't even register to her as words. Jolin didn't even bother to say anything to the man. She just kept stomping, her expression marred into that of one of righteous fury, all with a single thought boiling through her mind. Scum, that's all you are. Murdering a child, and over what? Money. Who the fuck kills a kid for money? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? She screamed internally, with the only reason why she wasn't screaming it out loud was because she didn't want to draw any attention to herself. It was only after he stopped moving, and the pop-up for her completing the quest appeared in front of her, and giving her the rewards it had promised her, advancing her to level 2, that she realized that she had killed him. His head had been shaved down to half of what it was originally, with it evenly laying across the ground, a pool of cherry-red liquid surrounding where his face used to be, with it thankfully face down so she didn't have to see it. Jolin merely stared down at her handiwork where she was sure the sound of her heart beating and her breathing should have been after she had done something that would have taken a lot of stamina, despite the fact that her stamina meter hadn't dipped down, even in the slightest, there was nothing. It was weird, but she didn't question it. She narrowed her eyes, staring down at her handiwork, as her expressionless face morphed into a full-on sneer. Most people would feel disgusted with killing another person. But this wasn't a person. Not to her. He was scum no, that was an insult to scum. At least scum realized what they were doing was wrong, and recognized where it had gone wrong. 
This guy, though she didn't know him, striked her as the type of person to not have any realizations for their wrongdoings. The only thing she was worried about was if she was going to leave behind any evidence. The last thing she wanted to do was have to deal with the police. Yo, yeah, Mono? If the cops use whatever funky tech they have to track DNA, will any of mine be on his body? No, Jolin. As a matter of fact, you do not have any sort of physical DNA on your person. Furthermore, you do not have any organs, aside from your vagina, cervix, uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovaries due to the gender you selected for yourself. You are essentially a walking, talking, living doll made of flesh and bone, and not much else. Ah, uh, that's weird. So, what? I'm a fleshy sex doll? Jolin thought in disgust. I would not call you that, Jolin. But, if you are looking for a more direct comparison, it would be apt to say that, yes. If it makes you feel any better, the male models of a system user are practically the same, with the only organs they have being their testicles, scrotum and penis. It, in fact, does not make me feel any better, but whatever. And with that Jolin left the alleyway, but not before looking back at the body of the child and wincing. The soulless, lifeless stare that the corpse shot in her direction, as if to say that she wasn't fast enough to save them, hurt her deeply. Maybe it was because she knew what it was like to die young, but seeing someone else young, dead, hurt her more profoundly than anyone else. She knew what it was like to have her life cut short. By now, her family, her real family must have forgotten about her by now. While she couldn't remember them, or hell, even remember their names, most people moved on after losing someone, so they would most likely do that. Or, they could be dead. For all she knew, when she died, time could have sped up, and thus they perished before she was even done making her current appearance. Rest in peace, kid. Jolin thought as she made her way back to the building. Before she entered the apartment building, she stared down at her right foot and leg, seeing the blood and frowning. If I track this into the building that would definitely... Before she could finish her sentence the blood vaporized away, as if it wasn't even there in the first place. She would ask what that was about, but she chalked it up to having something to do with Mono and her being a system user. And so, with that, she re-entered the building, ignored the foul-smelling carpet, and marched her way back up the stairs and into her apartment but not before seeing one of her neighbors standing out in the hallway. It was a woman. She looked like she was about the same age as a person in their mid to late 30s, save for the wrinkles on her face, either due to stress or something else along those lines. She was dressed in a yellow turtleneck with a flower pattern collar and a pair of form-fitting yoga pants. She had curly black hair and the same tannish white skin as everyone else she had met had. Dark brown piercing eyes glared at Jolin, as if she had committed some kind of cardinal sin. You ungrateful foreigners, making noise at night. You bad for community. The woman spoke in broken English. It was only then that Jolin realized that she had been speaking in Japanese the whole time, which was weird because one would have thought that she would have noticed by now. Regardless, Jolin wasn't exactly a fan of the sentiment. And so, in perfect Japanese, she spoke. How about you take out whatever you've got shoved up your tiny little arse and go back to sleep, Grandma? And with that, Jolin re-entered her apartment as the sound of a flabbergasted woman echoed in the hallway. Either she was offended or had not expected someone who looked like a foreigner to have spoken fluent Japanese or both. Whatever the case was, Jolin didn't care. Closing and locking the door to her apartment, Jolin wandered her way over to the last remaining closed door in her apartment and opened it. To her expectations, it was her bedroom. The bedroom consisted of a single four-drawer dresser, a bed with a metal frame and full metal alchemist-themed bed sheets, blankets, and pillows, blackout curtains covering the window behind her bed, and a bedside table with a lamp and an electric alarm clock reading the time as 7.30 p.m. It's only 7.30. Jolin muttered, walking over to her bed and sitting on it. The covers were tacky as all get out, but they were charming. She didn't know the reason behind them, so she wasn't going to discard them. 
Knowing her luck, they were probably a gift or something from her parents or Hinata. She had expected the bedroom to be small, but not this small. It was just big enough for the bed, the table, some legroom between the bed and the left-hand wall, a small walking space from the bed to the door, and the dresser which sat at the edge of the room against the wall. Strangely, Jolin didn't feel tired. As a matter of fact, she didn't feel tired at all. After all of the moving around that she did, she had expected to be at least a little tired. Well, physically, she wasn't tired. But emotionally she was drained. The death of that child, even if she hadn't known him, was far too much for her to handle so soon in this new world. I'm going to lay down, she muttered, only for Mono to speak up. You are aware that system users do not need to sleep, are you not? Why waste your time doing something so pointless when you can train, get stronger, and work toward the goal that you have set before you? Her goal, right, to save the world from itself. That was outlandish. Yeah, she was special and all that cool stuff, but why would she bother to do it? What was the point? What do I even get out of that in the first place? The satisfaction of saving the world, stroking my ego, is that all it is? Would you like a reward to be given after completing the quest? Do you even need to ask? I suppose not. One moment, please. And so she waited, laying her head down on propped up pillows and atop the covers. Her legs crossed one over the other with her arms underneath her chest as Mono, eventually, fetched her the quest's details. Ending quest. Save the world from itself good ending. Difficulty. Insane. Prevent the apocalypse from happening. Defeat and kill. And ensure hope in the next generation. Rewards. 250,000 XP, 100,000 yen. Note. You must complete seven more story quests before you may attempt this quest. Zero seventh story quests have been completed. 100% of total story quests still need to be completed. I see, Jolin hummed, the quest disappearing. So, what, I have seven story quests I gotta do? Big whoop. That sounds fairly easy. Just because it sounds easy, Jolin, does not mean that it is easy. That is why I urge you to take on some of those aforementioned dungeons and attempt a few side quests before you decide to sleep. It would be far more beneficial than lazing around. You have an opportunity that not many others get. You have been chosen by Loki, by the greater will and the lesser mind, to be one of the very lucky few who get to hold the power of a multiversal system. I urge you to not squander it. Look, Mamo. Jalen began as she turned on her left side. I get it. I'm special, whatever. I just saw a dead kid, and I killed a man. Give me a break. I'm not being lazy. I'm emotionally exhausted. I just got resurrected for Christ's sake, and I don't even remember who I was before this whole mess. Give me some time to at least adjust myself before you throw me to the wolves. Mono was silent for a few moments. The silence was deafening, and it was clear to Jolin that the system was having a difficult time understanding what it was that she meant. But, eventually, he responded. I see. Very well. I will give you some time to adjust yourself. But do try to remember that waiting too long will only hinder you in the end. Have a good rest, Jolin Brooks. And as soon as Mono finished speaking, Jolin's eyes closed, and she drifted off to sleep.